Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare. I want to thank my colleague, Councilmember Diana Ayala, who's the Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, uh, for, uh, for uh, assisting and helping uh, holding this important hearing on shelter accommodations and services for those with disabilities. I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson for being a champion on this issue and for hiring the City Council's first ever liaison to the disability community, Anastasia Somoza. I want to thank Anastasia uh, as well for helping to uh, prepare for today's hearing. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, excellent insight. Uh, according to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, an estimated 38 percent of all sheltered homeless individuals across the country live with disabilities. People with disabilities in New York City are 9.3% more likely than people without disabilities to spend more than 50% of their income on rent. The poverty rate for people with disabilities in the city is 36.5%, double the poverty rate of people without disabilities. These statistics demonstrate the disproportionate representation of people with disabilities in the homeless population. We as a city need to do more to ensure that there are proper processes in place to meet the needs of this population. In May 2015, the Legal Aid Society, Coalition for the Homeless, and Sydney, CIDNY, filed a class action lawsuit against the City of New York, Butler versus the City of New York, for failing to address the needs of people with disabilities in this homeless shelter program. Clearly, as evidenced by the mere existence of the Butler lawsuit and the settlement that followed, the city is not doing enough. The Butler Settlement Agreement was considered a win for New York City's disabled population. It outlines a long list of terms that the city must implement, including hiring a Director of Disability Affairs to ensure policies give people with disabilities meaningful access to DHS shelter services, hiring access and functional needs coordinators to work in each DHS, DHS intake office and assessment shelter, training staff who interact with interact with shelter applicants and residents about the laws related to disability rights, and the list goes on. As I understand it, within five years of the settlement, which was reached in May of 2017, DHS should have the capacity to accommodate any person with disabilities. While Butler is certainly a win, I am troubled to learn that DHS might be taking steps counter to the very agreement that was reached in this settlement. It has come to my attention that on June 22, 2018, DHS issued a change in policy to prohibit single adults who require assistance with their activities of daily living, or ADLs, to be transferred to DHS shelters from hospitals and nursing homes. That is a DHS policy as of June 22, 2018. According to this new procedure, DHS, ad sorry, single adults are, quote, de facto medically inappropriate for DHS facilities, close quote, if they have, quote, an inability to care for self and independently manage activities of daily living, close quote. If a client can't meet all 12 ADLs listed, that person is deemed ineligible for shelter. The list includes transferring from a wheelchair to bed independently, carrying a food tray, and dressing independently. According to this list, a person with a simple broken arm in need of assistance putting on a shirt would not qualify for shelter. What alternative does, does the city have to provide shelter for individuals requiring, require, who require assistance with ADLs? Is there a plan in place? This new policy seems to leave New York City's disabled population in need of shelter with nowhere else to go other than the streets. It has also come to my attention that on April 30th, 2018, this year, the only homeless shelter in New York City run by barrier-free living that served ADL-dependent individuals with disabilities closed. While the shelter only had 32 beds, these were the only beds in the shelter system that allowed the services of a home care aide for clients. What has the city been doing for those who can no longer live at this shelter? What is, the, what is the city's long-term plan to shelter individuals who require such services if, only, if the only shelter that served this population is shut down? Furthermore, what went into the process of this shelter shutting down? It had been in existence for over 20 years. Um, it is alarming that we would allow as a system 
a shelter that is so specific and serves such a critical need to close. We want to get a sense of what is being done for those in shelter who have disabilities. We've heard from advocates that bathrooms are not accessible, sometimes requiring persons with disabilities to keep stall doors open to accommodate their wheelchairs. We've heard from, wheel from a wheelchair user that he cannot get into the bed provided to him because it is not level to his wheelchair, leaving him no choice but to sleep in his wheelchair. The committees here today want to use this public forum to gain a better understanding of where the Department of Homeless Services is in terms of implementation of the terms of the Butler Agreement. We also want to ensure that there is a plan in place for people with disabilities who are not in shelter currently but may require shelter in the future. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the committee staff who has helped put together today's hearing, Committee Counsel Aminta Kilowan, Policy Analysts Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, Finance Analyst Namira Nuzhat, and Finance Unit Head Doheny Sampora, as well as my Chief of Staff Jonathan Boucher, Policy Director Edward Paulino, and Legislative Director Elizabeth Adams, as well as the Council's Community Engagement Staff Lynn Schulman and Anastasia Somoza. Uh, I'd like to now turn it over uh, to my co-chair, Council Member and Chair Diana Ayala, who I understand just had a granddaughter. Uh, so we want to offer our congratulations you. to you, Chair. Um, and I want to turn it over to you for uh, your opening statement. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Levin, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, and I would like to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, with last year's settlement on the Butler versus City of New York class action lawsuit, this hearing will focus on examining the steps that the city is taking to ensure disabled New Yorkers seeking accommodation in New York City's shelter system will have their needs met in a timely manner by a well-informed staff. While barriers for individuals with disabilities are in the process of being removed, we know that we still have more to do to ensure that, uh, if needed, every disabled New Yorker would be able to effectively navigate and successfully access the shelter system. According to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, an estimated 40% of homeless individuals presenting for admission to shelters have disabilities. Today, our city shelters have been unable to adequately provide the necessary reasonable accommodations to ensure that each individual is able to access what is needed to perform the fundamental and necessary activities of daily living. While some barriers may be structural in nature, we are certain that others can be resolved by training shelter staff to be aware of the rights of individuals with disabilities and teaching them to provide reasonable accommodations in accordance with local, state, and federal laws. This issue has personal resonance for me because in my own, in my own district of East Harlem, Mount Haven, and the South Bronx, uh, have at times struggled with issues of accessibility and housing insecurity. And with approximately 62,000 men and women in shelter in New York City presenting for shelter on any given night, we must ensure that all individuals, including those with disabilities, are provided with reasonable accommodations and safe settings with trained staff. While we recognize that the one size does not fit all, and know the challenges of meeting the needs of individuals with disabilities may not always seem easy, we also know that providing comprehensive services in a matter consistent with the safety and well-being of each person presenting for admission to shelter is absolutely essential. We look forward to hearing from all of the stakeholders here today in order to work towards building a better shelter system for individuals with disabilities that is consistent with the laws that govern them. I would like to thank the committee staff, Council Sarah Liss, Policy Analyst Christy uh, Dyer, or Dwyer, I like pronouncing it wrong, um, finance analyst Jeanette Murrow, and my chief of staff, Millie Bonilla, and my legislative director, Bianca Almedina, for making this hearing uh, possible. Finally, I would like to recognize the committee members that have joined us, Council Member Alika Ambry samuel Council Member Barry Gwedenche, Council Member Jimmy Van Brenner, and Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Did I miss it? Oh, Bob oh. Holden. Council Member Bob Holden. Thank you, Bob, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ayala. Um, so we were originally scheduled to have two uh, members of the public testify on the panel. First, two people um, living with disabilities who have experienced um, uh, uh, going through the shelter intake process and, and wanted to share uh, their experiences, Dustin Jones and Rosa Amparo. Uh, Mr. Jones, unfortunately, couldn't be here today because um, of a flood at, uh, at the Wards Island Shelter where he's residing, um, which prohibited him uh, from being able to come down here 
uh, because um, the only accessible bathroom in, uh, in, at, the, at his Wards Island shelter uh, was, was flooded and it, it prevented him from being able to be here. Ms. Amparo, who wanted to share her experience of um, uh, not being able to access shelter as a single adult in need of shelter, um, is unfortunately in the hospital, and so she is unable to testify as well. Um, and so we are going to hear from the administration first, but I want to acknowledge both of them. I want to thank them for their willingness to, to testify and for their advocacy. Um, and if anything, this highlights um, uh, the need for uh, this hearing and the need for uh, a, a, a better understanding, public understanding and understanding of this council as to what the situation is on the ground within the DHS system. So with that, uh, I'm going to um, uh, call on the administration uh, to testify. We have Commissioner Stephen Banks of the New York City Department of Social Services, Aaron Goodman from Social Services, Martha Calhoun from Social Services, and uh, I see here Commissioner Victor Khaleesi of uh, the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities. So. Uh, can I ask you all uh, to raise your right hand, please? Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Uh, we have extensive testimony that we're giving you for the record. Um, I want to highlight some of the aspects of it. Uh, but first, I want to uh, really address the two clients who are going to s testify here uh, this morning. Um, as you know, I've represented clients before I got this job for many years, and I understand how challenging it is, uh, and I admire both of them for wanting to testify. Uh, each of them, their cases illustrated some significant problems in our uh, system that even as we're making reforms, individuals' cases sometimes reveal gaps in those reforms. Uh, and for one individual, the gap was the nature of the uh, uh, police uh, searches involving wheelchairs, which have been the source of, uh, of some contraband, and we didn't have the right procedure, and, uh, and one of the clients uh, was not treated in the way we would want him to be treated. Uh, and as a result of his experience, we've issued a new uh, NYPD procedure for appropriate searches of wheelchairs. And uh, Commissioner Khaleesi, I want to just thank him publicly for his effort in that, uh, in that initiative to make sure that we had proper procedures in place to address that problem. Uh, we'll certainly follow up with the help uh, shelter provider uh, with respect to uh, uh, Clark Thomas. There is more than one accessible bathroom there, and we will follow up to see what happened uh, and, f and uh, report back to you offline to the committee chair in terms of that circumstance. Uh, the other client who is going to testify, I think, highlighted a gap between HRA and DHS uh, with respect to the fact that a domestic violence shelter, uh, when a particular individual had reached the 180-day limit set by state law, uh, that rather than working through the procedures that we have in place, to make sure that there is a seamless transition between two agencies which are now integrated, uh, that that wasn't appropriately handled in this particular case, and we have put some additional protocols in place to make sure that the kind of experience that she had isn't repeated. Uh, I come to you to testify today uh, about a number of topics relating to providing services to New Yorkers with disabilities. But I also want to frame it, and we'll get into some detail here, that the changes we're making in the DHS uh, shelter system follow the changes that we have made already in HRA in terms of providing services. 
and they're really framed by two lawsuits. One is Lovely H uh, that had uh, brought in 2005 against HRA, uh, and the second uh, was brought before the 90-day review against DHS, the Butler lawsuit, both of which are settled with federal court um, supervision. And I think that uh, we would want you to have confidence in what we're going to do with the Butler settlement in respect to the uh, shelter system based upon what we've been able to do in the Lovely Age Settlement for HRA. When I came to HRA, on an annual caseload of 600,000 individuals either getting ongoing or one-time assistance in families or in individual households, we were giving annually 90, 90 reasonable accommodations. Today, uh, annually, we're giving 46,000 reasonable accommodations to clients seeking help uh, at HRA. And that's the approach that we are going to take with respect to the reforms that are laid out in the Butler settlement to address the needs of uh, the clients of, of DHS. Um, I'm joined here today by uh, General Counsel with the Department of Social Services, Martha Calhoun, as well as uh, my colleague, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of People uh, with Disabilities, Commissioner Victor Khaleesi, and also Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel, Cleo King. Uh, we've given you a, a, an update on where we are returning the tide. Uh, perhaps during some questions we'll come back to that point, but I want to come back to uh, the subject of, of uh, the hearing and focus on, I think, one of the most important aspects of turning the tide is phasing out uh, 360 shelter sites uh, and replacing them with 90-day sparrow-based shelters. And there, I want to report to you significant progress, which is very relevant to the topic of this hearing. Uh, at the time of turning the tide's announcement uh, last year, we were in 647 locations. Uh, and uh, we've already uh, reduced the number of sites that we're in down to 468. That's almost a 30 percent uh, of our goal of a 45 percent reduction. So it's a pretty significant reduction. And I think, as you know from prior hearings, we prioritize phasing out the clusters where uh, there tend to be walk-ups. Uh, and uh, in addition, there is not air conditioning, which is one of the reasonable accommodations that many of our clients uh, want. And so as we continue to phase out the 360 shelter locations and replace them uh, with a small number of 90 borough based shelters, we are committed to siting shelters that increase and enhance the shelter system's ability to provide meaningful access to DHS shelter and services for applicants and clients with disabilities, as well as increase our capacity to place children and adults as close as possible to the anchors of life, schools, jobs, health care, houses of worship, and family. Uh, as we have developed new purpose-built shelters, of which we anticipate 25 of the 90 shelters will be purpose-built shelters, uh, as well as implement various capital improvements and design and construction projects in the shelter pipeline, uh, which were, they're all required to be compliant with all applicable codes, including requirements concerning accommodating people with disabilities or other reasonable accommodation needs. Uh, the shelter system will further develop to meet the needs of clients with disabilities. Indeed, with a capital budget of $300 million for shelter development and improvement, we are increasing the proportion of existing shelter units that are accessible for people with disabilities. Both through the agency's work on the Butler settlement and in general, we're working to improve the client experience by updating intake processes to ensure they're comprehensive, understandable, and properly implemented. But it's also important to remember that this is a shelter system that's built up in a very haphazard way over 40 years. Uh, the Butler settlement was agreed to uh, in, uh, approved by the federal judge in December uh, 2017. And the report we're giving you today is essentially on 10 months of reforming a 40-year system. Uh, in the DHS uh, system, DHS uh, allows for reasonable accommodations for requests to be made at any time, uh, not only an intake. The agency will be revising and updating intake forms through the Butler process, including updates to the system of record, which will also include ensuring that shelter eligibility investigations take disabilities into account when looking at potential viable non-shelter housing options. In the DHS system, families are placed in private rooms with either private or shared bathrooms, and these units can accommodate home health aides and or visiting nurse services for persons in need of such services, such as those who cannot independently complete the activities of daily living. Shelter for single adults being congregate settings under state regulation cannot provide space and services to meet those needs. 
to more effectively respond to these New Yorkers who turn to DHS for help, DHS has had since 2010 an institutional referral discharge procedure. Uh, last June, we updated that procedure to create fillable forms. The substance of the procedure is essentially the same. We created additional instructions for uh, discharging entities to try to expedite determinations. I think it's important to understand this procedure for what it is. It's a procedure that's focused on hospitals and nursing homes who discharge clients to the shelter system. It's important to focus on the most important aspect of this procedure, which is the shelter system is not a default for other institutions that have discharge planning responsibilities. And we'll get into some of the numbers, but I think you'll see uh, that there hasn't been a change uh, going back over a period of time in the numbers of people that we provide shelter to or discharged from hospitals or discharged from nursing homes in comparison to those that we, that we believe their needs cannot be met in shelter consistent with state regulation which limits who shelters can provide uh, assistance to. Having said that, we recognize this is a significant problem. It's reflective of the affordability crisis that we've talked about often at these hearings in terms of the ability for people to uh, obtain and retain housing. Uh, in addition to the discharge policy that you referenced earlier, which relates to hospitals and um, nursing homes, the uh, home-based programs are focused on trying to keep people who are in housing in their homes because of the data uh, that you referenced before in terms of the numbers of people in the community with disabilities. I'm sure we'll get into some of that more with the questions uh, back and forth, and I can give you the exact information about the numbers of dischargers from hospitals and nursing homes that are affected by, again, a policy which has been in effect since 2010. As I said earlier, the settlement in Lovely H and Butler exemplify the reforms we're trying to put in place to provide clients with disabilities with meaningful access to our services after many years when they have been barriers to obtaining essential services. In recognition of the major reform efforts that are involved, federal district court judges approve both settlements with multi-year implementation plans and milestones. The Lovely H case, as I said, was brought in 2005 and was high, settled by administration in 2015 within a year of when I became the commissioner, highlighted the problems of persons with disabilities in need of public benefits, experienced in obtaining and maintaining those benefits and services to which they're entitled, including their needs for reasonable accommodations. And as I said at the time, uh, when we began those reforms, a, in an annual basis, only 90 uh, reasonable accommodations had been issued. Uh, DSS is committed to ensuring that people with disabilities get the help they need, and therefore we settled the case to make public benefits more accessible to people with disabilities. Pursuant to the milestones in the federal court approved settlement, we're improving our ability to screen clients in need of reasonable accommodation as a result of physical or mental health disabilities, as well as providing case management. For example, through Lovely H, we've issued agency-wide reasonable accommodation and modification policy, created a reasonable accommodation request, review, determination, and appeals process, assisted clients in obtaining clinical documentation to support the reasonable accommodation requests, developed a client services screen that informs staff of all active reasonable accommodations for clients, sent clients pre- and post-appointment reminders to assist them in meeting program requirements, created a direct contact number specifically to serve clients with homebound home visit needed status, formed a disability adv advisory panel to share information with and greater expertise and input and feedback from the disability community, implemented a full day introduction to disabilities training that is mandatory for all employees, developed and are implementing a supervisory training that supports frontline supervisors and their ability to oversee the implementation of reasonable accommodation at their HRA sites, train staff and develop reasonable accommodation processing and notification services in HRA central call centers such as Infoline, created an office hours partnership between HRA staff and street homeless outreach teams to expedite homebound status services to street homeless clients, issued a plain language and clear design policy to create client notices that are easier to read for clients with cognitive and visual disabilities, work with expert consultants to develop a disability screening tool currently being implemented at five sites throughout the city and in the process of being rolled out to all HRA job centers, Many of, why is this relevant to Butler? Many of the policies and practices implemented at HRA pursuant to Lovely H also benefit DHS clients as well as DHS service delivery. 
with the integration of DHS and HRA within the shared services model last year. Uh, DSS, this allows DSS offices such as finance, communications, personnel, external affairs, and training to serve both agencies and share best practices and experiences from Lovely H with respect to Butler. As a result, practices such as improved communication mechanisms, materials for people who are blind or low vision, and training of staff working with clients who are deaf or hard of hearing benefit the client of both agencies. With respect to Butler, DHS has the legal and moral mandate to provide essential shelter on demand to all eligible families and individuals who need it, and on the same day on which they apply. This re requires having a system that not only has sufficient capacity and vacancies to be able to appropriately assign persons within the system, but a system that also provides sufficient capacity to accommodate the varying needs of people with disabilities. In December 2017, the City of New York reached that federal court settlement that you and I have referred to. Uh, it's multi-year litigation uh, to enhance access to shelter and its intended services for applicants and clients with disabilities. Settlement capped years of productive negotiations with the Legal Aid Society. Class counsel not only for a class of plaintiffs that includes all applicants for and clients of DHS shelter who have disabilities, but also two institutional plaintiffs, the Center for Independence of the Disabled of New York and the Coalition of the Homeless. The settlement, including the multi-year reform plan, was signed by all parties and approved by a federal court judge in the Southern District of New York, Judge Sweet, after a public comment period. The settlement is monitored by the Legal Aid Society over a period of five years from its effective date, and pursuant to the terms of the settlement, Legal Aid is able to review and comment on DHS deliverables, including new and revised procedures, as well as accessibility survey tool developed by DHS expert consultant and proposed remediation plans. The communication structure outlined in the settlement provides an avenue through which advocates can provide impact, input on many of, uh, of the ways in which DHS is in, uh, enhancing its system and improving its system to increase uh, shelter access for people with disabilities. At a December 7, 2017 fairness hearing on the agreement, Judge Sweet approved the settlement reached between the agency and legal aid, uh, and there were no, uh, all comments were positive. The comprehensive settlement provides the City of New York will do the following. Enhance DHS's practices to ensure all applicants and clients with disabilities are provided reasonable accommodations to ensure meaningful access to homeless shelter. Utilizing the services of an expert consultant, survey intake sites, assessment sites, and selected shelters to identify barriers to access and uh, develop remediation plans to enhance accessible features in existing shelters. Modify existing procedures as needed to enforce best practices in line with legal standards regarding accessibility and retrain staff consistent with the federal, state, and city disability rights and DHS enhanced practices related to disability rights. Ensure that shelter evacuation plans recognize the particular needs of people with disabilities. Provide communication accommodations for individuals who have vision or hearing disabilities. Conduct a population analysis of the DHS system based on available data sets to determine the percentages and types of persons with disabilities seeking or using DHS shelter services. And overall, ensure the agency has sufficient accessible capacity to meet the needs of homeless applicants and clients with disabilities. DHS is committed to these reforms in order to improve shelter accessibility for individuals with disabilities. Even before its effective date on December 2017, DHS began work pursuant to the settlement because we recognize the important opportunity to reform our agency's practices and ensure all applicants and clients with disabilities have meaningful access to the homeless shelter system. Given the magnitude of the reform effort, the parties agreed to and the federal card approved a five-year implementation timeline with interim milestones. One key benchmark we executed in con is contracting with an expert architectural consulting firm to develop a DHS shelter survey tool consistent with the Department of Justice guidelines and survey existing DHS shelters, including all intake and assessment sites and other shelters already classified as accessible, and provide training such that DHS teams can continue survey work of additional and new shelters and develop remediation plans to increase accessible shelter capacity, including an initial remediation plan by April 2019. For this expert and comprehensive analysis, in consultation with the Legal Aid Society, DHS contracted with Stephen Winter Associates, an expert architectural and building systems consulting firm with experts, expertise in accessible design and ADA guidelines and construction requirements of federal and state and local laws. 
SWA has a vast experience in this area, exemplified by their ongoing work since 2004 with respect to a consent decree between the U.S. Department of Justice and the Housing Authority of Baltimore, through which uh, SWA has conducted field inspections of thousands of dwelling units and created remediation plans to ensure that the Housing Authority in Baltimore was in compliance with the Americans with Disability Act. Their expertise working with plaintiffs, government agencies, and housing programs make them uniquely well su suited to assist DHS with its accessibility-based efforts. Moreover, the Department of Justice was one of the references we consulted regarding SWA before we hired them, and pursuant to the settlement, the Legal Aid Society approved the city's hiring of F SWA. Under the settlement and in accordance with the terms of the city's hiring of SWA, the expert consultant will survey existing intake and assessment sites as well as a stock of over 60 other shelters to assess accessibility at those shelters pursuant to the ADA Accessibility Guidelines and the Federal Department of Justice ADA Best Practices Toolkit, develop and implement a DHS facility survey tool as well as attendant training for DHS staff to continue to survey shelters in its system as well as new shelters that are coming online, identify accessible features of facilities and individual units that can be added to DHS's building compliance system so as to make better and more accurate placements for clients with disabilities into appropriate shelter locations, and propose remediation of existing shelters to enhance and improve accessibility options for the DHS shelter system. Our survey work with SWA involves conducting full-day, in-depth surveys at select DHS shelters that evaluates access to every public space in the shelter, ranging from the shelter entrance to every common area, library, cafeteria, sleeping unit type, bathroom type, water fountain, and more. This analysis, combined with a population analysis, will provide deep insight into the current and anticipated characteristics of individuals with disabilities in shelter, along with the ways in which we can ameliorate barriers for them to access shelter services. The initial analysis is expected to be completed in the spring of 2019, and we look forward to using the tools as a means to enhance our shelters in a manner that best serves individuals with disabilities. We are already using lessons learned in the early stages of the architectural analysis to inform our efforts in citing new shelters and shrinking the shelter footprint through turning the tide. Our success thus far in meeting this benchmark, as well as many others, is in large part due to a robust working group system that we developed to enable staff across DSS and HRA and DHS to work together to implement the various components of the five-year plan. In this framework, staff members from more than 16 different program areas within our agencies collaborate to pool ideas and resources to maximize services for clients. With the Butler settlement, we are also expanding on our existing agency-wide goal to develop more enhanced reasonable accommodation processes for clients and applicants with disabilities. As I've testified previously, the DSS Office of Disability Affairs ensures that the ability to request reasonable accommodations is readily available and simple, and that staff is properly trained on how to assist and expedite requests. Again, that's how we went from 90 reasonable accommodations annually to 46,000 at HRA. The integrated working group framework to implement the Butler Settlement has allowed DHS to draw from the previous lessons learned from uh, the Office of Disability Affairs overall work and the work related to Lovely H and collaborate with staff representing adult shelters, uh, <coughs> service, uh, adult shelters, family shelters, constituent services, customized assistance services and information technology services and numerous other offices in our agencies to work out policy and procedures uh, that will best implement reasonable accommodations across the agencies. A key component of this work is not only revising and retraining on processes and procedures, but also making the process more client-friendly and client-centric, and empowering staff to be able to grant these accommodations on site as much as possible. The DHS Director of Disability Affairs adds additional review and expertise in enhancing these efforts. Finally, pursuant to the settlement, to add more resources to this effort, DHS will be developing a team of disability and functional need or DAFN coordinators, who will work directly on the ground with DHS clients and program staff at intake and assessment shelters, as well as program shelters, to triage issues pertaining to disabilities and reasonable accommodations, offer specific advice and know-how, advocate for clients expressing accessibility-based needs, and focus on and identify areas of improvement and training. In relation to the agreed-upon five-year implementation time uh, line stipulated in the Butler Settlement, which is overseen by the federal courts and monitored by legal aid, we're in line with the milestone time frame or have, when needed, received a formal modification. To date, we've completed the following deliverables and milestones. 
As mentioned, we've hired an expert consultant firm, SWA. Since that time, we developed the DHS facility survey tool with the Legal Aid Society approved and have begun surveying our intake and assessment uh, sites. Our shelter survey selection criteria were also shared with the Legal Aid Society. We conducted an initial baseline population analysis, which we expect to repeat periodically throughout the process, uh, refining it as systems become more refined to track individual specific requests and needs. <coughs> we instituted an informal relief mechanism by which advocates through legal aid can work with our agency's legal team to triage reasonable re combination requests. A director of disability affairs was hired, and as indicated previously, a DAFN team is in the process of being hired. To ensure continuity of access to shelter and shelter-based services for our clients with disabilities who may be absent from shelter during hospitalization or institutional placement or clients entering shelter from such a facility, we developed, as I discussed earlier, uh, and provide a legal aid with DHS's referral from healthcare facilities policy and a staff best practice guide. In addition to reasonable accommodation work described above, we are revising our reasonable accommodation procedures and will be sharing drafts with legal aid in accordance with the timetable and the settlement. Lastly, we're in negotiations with the Legal Aid Society about the details of a monitoring protocol, which includes our progress uh, implementing the settlement terms and performance and outcomes implementing our procedure and architectural changes. As mentioned, DHS conducted an initial baseline population analysis pursuant to the settlement to determine the extent to the shelter, uh, the shelter population may have a functional need and require some form of placement-related reasonable accommodation for a disability. This would include accommodations such as placements and accessible sites for people using wheelchairs, air conditioning, durable medical equipment or auxiliary aids for communication, and placements in mental health shelters. The Legal Aid Society reviewed, commented on, and helped improve the initial analysis, which is based on existing data in the DHS CARES system of record, as well as other systems, including the Welfare Management System, SDX, and information from the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey and we'll con this will continue to be refined as we enhance our systems through the five-year plan to implement the Butler Settlement and are able to collect more nuanced data. The initial analysis, which represents an analysis as of November 2017 shelter residents, showed that 28% of households included one or more people who may have a condition requiring air conditioning. 28% included one or more person who may have a condition requiring specific appliances or medical equipment and 18% of households included at least one person who may experience some form of mobility disability requiring accommodation. For example, may, someone may require wheelchair-based accessibility options. Overall, however, 61% of households in the DHS shelter system included at least one person who may experience a disabling condition that may require placement-related reasonable accommodation. Although this initial analysis represents a specific point in time and the shelter population is not static, this essential ex extensive analysis uh, uh, is uh, incredibly valuable in developing an initial level of understanding of people living in shelter, and we are proceeding to build up systems in accordance with us understanding. As we continue refining the analysis of the needs of the shelter population and turning the tide of homelessness, we're prioritizing getting out of cluster sites, which overall tend to provide less access to features such as air conditioning and or wheelchair accessibility than other types of shelter. We are confident that the overarching aim of the Butler Settlement, which is to provide reasonable accommodations, communicate effectively with clients with disabilities, and improve accessibility for people with disabilities who are homeless, will improve on our existing efforts to serve all New Yorkers who need services. In addition, the testimony covers, as we've previously testified, the role of the Office of Disability Affairs. I'm going to leave that in the record, uh, and if there are questions about it, we will come through there. I want to just highlight, at the, to close though, the transforming of the shelter system through new investments and partnerships, which we've talked about at prior hearings, but I think is particularly relevant uh, at this particular hearing. The city's made important progress in transforming that haphazard system that I described that's been decades in the making by investing in historically underfunded not-for-profit service providers and facilities to ensure those partners are appropriately funded to deliver the services our homeless neighbors depend on as they get back on their feet addressing conditions that have built up over many years, implementing the NYPD management team to oversee shelter security citywide, and raising the bar for services that we provide our homeless clients, moving away from a one-size-fits-all strategy towards a people and community-based system that is responsive to families and individuals' unique needs. This includes 
addressing shelter conditions built up over decades through comprehensive repairs, renovations, and new partnerships with the NYPD to ensure a safe and secure environment for New Yorkers in need as they get back on their feet. In 2016 and 2017 calendar years, the mayor's interagency shelter uh, repair squad conducted more than 34,000 inspections and reduced violations that went under, unaddressed uh, uh, for many years by 84%. We've allocated the necessary funding to make further major renovations, improving shelter conditions that have built up over decades, and we'll continue making progress restoring our infrastructure. And investing in historically underfunded facilities and providers, dedicating unprecedented dollars, more than a quarter of a billion new dollars annually, to modernizing the outdated rates that our vital pro provider partners have been receiving for years to ensure those partners are appropriately funded to deliver the services our homeless clients depend on as they get back on their feet, while expanding education focused programs and increasing our social work staffing and mental health uh, services. I want to just conclude by saying overall the administration uh, is continually demonstrated its priority of improving our policies at our agency systems and services to better the lives of low-income New Yorkers, including those with physical and mental disabilities. Beginning with the 90-day review of homeless services, we're focused on implementing measures that reinforce systemic change that will outlive the five-year plan laid out in the Butler Settlement. We are still less than a year into implementing the reforms set forth in the Butler Settlement, but the improvements we are making now and over the next five years will set the city as a leader in implementing ADA-compliant approaches to enhance shelter accessibility. Our work to date has already helped us identify effective practices for how to serve clients with disabilities, and using the integrated working group framework, we've been able to implement procedures that reflect an efficient uniform system even among the programs that contain significant operational differences. Moving forward, the insight gained from this experience will allow us to best connect vulnerable New Yorkers to the services that enable them to thrive. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Commissioner Khaleesi and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a lot of questions. I'm taking over for Steve. <laughs> I, I've known you for some time now. I, I knew you would have a lot of questions. I hopefully I have a lot of answers. He's for letting questions. me go first. This is a big deal, guys. Um, can you, so what is, the, what is the process for training staffers now to identify different um, types of disabilities other than the, the checklist on the ADLs? So again, I want to put the ADLs in, in context. That is, the, that checklist that you're referring to yeah. is a discharge document that hospitals and nursing homes fill out before giving them to us so that we can find appropriate placements and where someone is being discharged from a hospital or nursing home improperly, in our opinion, we can push back and get someone more appropriately housed. The training that we are developing for our uh, staff for Butler is similar in scope to how we approach the training for Lovely H. We would carry a full day training, it was mandatory, supervisory training, but the exact kind of training is laid out in the milestones in the Butler settlement. I believe that we're providing uh, drafts of training uh, in, let me just consult with, with John yeah. Council. I just want to make sure I get the right date, but the, there's a very specific process for when we're supposed to provide the protocols for the training program to have the training. The legal be done? Uh, right. There's there's training that's been done, but the reason why I, I want to be careful in my answer is that the Butler process informs a iterative back and forth between the city and the Legal Aid Society, which I think is a good framework here. Uh, and we have an obligation to provide them with a more robust training uh, for staff, remembering that there are various milestones set out in the agreement, which I can go through with you in, in some detail. If you'll hang on one moment, I'll, I'll go through some of them that I think will give you some confidence about how this is, is proceeding. Um, so just walking us from December 2017 forward, so the Agreement was so awarded in December 7th, 2017. Uh, the 
uh, hiring of the um, of the architectural consultant uh, was required uh, to take place in in 2018. And actually, the engagement happened in 2017. Uh, we were required in February 2018 to implement an informal relief mechanism. That has been done. We were required to have uh, a accessibility survey tool for shelter sites, uh, monitoring protocol methodology, and begin the site surveys of the consultants by March 2018. That happened. We were required by June 2018 to have a population analysis and share reasonable accommodation selection menu, uh, which we did, which I can go through that menu if that would be helpful uh, with the Legal Aid Society. Uh, and we're required to provide uh, the first site selection criteria and continuing the monitoring protocol in August uh, 2018. That was done. Uh, we're required to share institutional referral policies and best practices and continue the site surveys in September 2018. That happened. We're required to share operational uh, reasonable accommodation procedures and hire uh, the disability uh, access functional needs coordinators that was slightly extended, but that's November 2018, and also uh, enhanced the reasonable accommodation in intake access process by November 2018. By uh, t December 2018, we're required to provide disability access training curriculum uh, and quality assurance measures, uh, and we're on track to do that, and also an accessible facility database, and we're, we're on track to do that. But uh, as I answered you initially, there is training, but we're very focused on making sure the training meets the standards of the agreement, and under the terms of the agreement, we're required to um, have the curriculum and the quality assurance message, uh, mechanisms uh, at that um, uh, by December 2018. I, I appreciate that because I, I think, right, we, we all agree that the, the first person who is in contact, the intake person, is like crucial, right, in determining the type and the level of, of, of services that an individual comes into the shelter needing, right, whether that is a, a disabilities accommodation or a mental health screening. So it's, it's really critical that that person be trained annually, if possible, um, or on a continuing basis on how to better identify those individual needs um, so that we're making sure that they're met. I agree with you. I just want to emphasize the addition of the disability uh, access and functional needs staffing, yes. uh, which is uh, c currently projected for November, is a very important piece of this. That, that There's no other shelter system in the country that has such staffing. Uh, it's an emergency management uh, concept, and I know uh, Commissioner Khaleesi has, a, ha has information on that that might be helpful to consider. We think adding that staff in addition to the training is really what's going to be game changing. So the training approach will be similar to what we took with Lovely H in terms of requiring it, uh, but the addition of these disability access and functional needs staff and staff is really important. Yeah, that's something we implemented in emergency management to ensure that we're giving the services for people with disabilities. Uh, and uh, they exist throughout the agencies, throughout the city as well. And it's something that it complements our disability service facilitators who also work with the city um, to ensure that accessibility is being met. Have you had the opportunity to visit any of the shelters? No, I haven't. You haven't? I think that, I mean, that's also a critical point, right? Um, it's, it's important that uh, individuals with disabilities are able to physically see the layouts right and provide input in terms because there are a lot of a lot of times we you know there are things that we don't we don't see right because we don't require a certain accommodation i, I for instance was walking down the street with someone that uh, is a wheelchair user got on a curb cut on one end of the street the other side of the street didn't have a curb cut so we couldn't exit so we had to turn back around go around onto the street i wouldn't have noticed it had i been with this this, this person so um in regards to the uh, the reasonable accommodations could you walk us through what some of those reasonable accommodations are with the exception of air conditioning and uh, wheelchair accessibility i mean if if an individual comes into a shelter uh, on Ward's Island, for instance, and they need to use the restroom, does the door close behind them? Are there uh, hand railings? What, 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 re what do you mean by reasonable accommodation? I, I think it's very important in answering your question to, to level set us back to what got us here. Yeah. 
the system is built up over 40 years without this kind of yeah. an approach, and the settlement is to reform it. One of the tasks that the settlement agreement requires us to do, uh, and in doing so, we consulted with Legal Aid, said we had to develop a reasonable accommodation menu, uh, and I think going through it will help you yes. get the context of the cool. how granular uh, this is. So. Uh, one category is access to facilities, and these are the kinds of menu items that will come down uh, to uh, for determinations. Med uh, medical or disabling condition requiring placement in a particular geographic location. Access to electrical outlets to power disability-related equipment. Placement with air conditioning and sleeping area. Placement in accessible unit or dorm for deaf or hard of hearing. Placement in elevator building and or first floor. Placement with accessible bathroom features. F specify, that says in the menu to specify, could include the following. Shower grab bars, toilet grab bars, lower toilet height, lower sink height. Placement with wheelchair accessible bathroom and or unit. Accessible transportation from intake to assessment and or to shelters and between shelter. Access to refrigeration for med medication expedited intake and placement, disability or medically related dietary needs, specify. Specify could include the following, renal dietary needs, diabetic dietary needs. Case management is another category on this menu. Help reading forms, help completing forms, permitting assistance by support person at appointments, assist with referrals to request appropriate equipment for medical or disabling condition, flexible scheduling uh, in intake, uh, 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 for, I'm sorry, flexible scheduling for in-shelter appointments. Communication is another category on the, on the menu that we developed. Help for people who are blind or low vision, specify. Uh, specify could include email, text if available, braille, large print, audio, data disks. Help for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, specify, spec specify could include the following, email, text if available, ASL, VRI, Spanish Sign Language or other language, tactile sign language, tactile fingerspelling. Miscellaneous category on the menu. Permit shelter access to professional home care attendant. Permit emotional support animal to reside in shelter. Service dog reside in shelter. Other applicant or client to specify or describe requested need. So that's a very comprehensive set of uh, question sets for a menu. Uh, it, it is um, a, a very significant reform for where things have been for the last 40 years. Does that include, I, I, don't, remember, I don't recall hearing, do you have uh, access to motorized beds as part of the medical equipment? I mean, meaning beds that you can, with a button lower if you need to get in and out of a wheelchair. This is one of the challenges where if someone requires that level of care, the discharge from a hospital, a discharge from a nursing home, we would have concerns about a determination made that shelter was the only alternative to such a person. I mean, but I think Commissioner Khaleesi is a, is a, is a great example of an able-bodied you know, individual who just happens to be a wheelchair user. Um, there, wouldn't, there shouldn't be any other impediment to him having access to the same level of shelter because he could possibly have some difficulty getting in and out of existing uh, beds. So I, I would have a problem, you know, referring um, someone like him back to a nursing home just because we don't have the appropriate equipment. Yeah, I think I, I over answered your question. Uh, we, someone, we would certainly work with Medicaid to see whether or not we could get appropriate equipment for somebody. But I think it might be helpful just to give you and also the chair uh, some context of these issues about um, ADLs. So in calendar year 2016, we had 1,000, uh, I'm sorry, we had 1,268 referrals from hospitals with 30 referrals from nursing homes. 37 referrals from hospitals were found to be individuals that we could not serve in shelter, 15 from nursing homes. In calendar year 2017, there were 1,260 referrals from hospitals, 30 from nursing homes again, and there were 37 from hospitals and five from nursing homes that we found we could not serve in shelter. So far in calendar year 2018, 
including since we issued um, a more streamlined way to use the same process, which has been in place since 2010. There have been 723 referrals from hospitals and 17 from nursing homes. That's January 1 through August 15th. Uh, there were 13 from hospitals found medically inappropriate and two from nursing homes. And again, our focus here is to make sure that all parts of the systems that exist that produce homelessness are focused on coming up with the best alternatives for people other than having to enter shelter. So the process is really a pushback on hospital discharges to make sure that somebody is being discharged to an appropriate place, particularly given state regulation. In, so refer in reference to shelter, and as you referred to me, I would be able to live under those circumstances because I would meet all those activities of daily living. So are, most, says, oh, are most of the challenging cases that are referred to DHS coming from facilities, or do you have examples of individuals that are maybe walking in, you know, uh, coming in to, to the intake center that are then found ineligible and referred to another facility? And if so, is there a list of facility or community partners that you could share with the council? So again, let's let's just take a look at the. Um, kinds of things that are that are that would be one of those 13 hospital discharges or two nursing home discharges so far this year uh, that would be an issue hang on just one sec so for example someone on a ventilator who's being discharged from a hospital we need the hospital to come up with a different discharge plan. Or somebody who has an inability to make their needs known or follow commands. We need the hospital, the nursing home, to make a, to help that person and not have shelter be the default. And these are right from the form that you're referring to before in terms of the kinds of, kinds of things that are ruled out. And I, I, I've known the, the chair for many, many years. I want to just respectfully disagree. It doesn't allow for screening someone out with a broken arm. We have, unfortunately, a number of people in our shelter system who have uh, broken arms. Uh, we're exercising a judgment to try to prevent shelter entries for people for whom other systems exist to help them. So what happens, I had, a, I had a case a couple of years ago when I was doing constituent services where we had a, a family um, that was being uh, evicted from public housing for reasons that I won't share, um, but they had a child who was disabled, who was born with a life expectancy of months and was able, you know, through the good care of her parents to live. She was eight years old. She was blind, deaf, you know, nonverbal, required a feeding tube, um, was completely bed bound. That family gets evicted, and now they come to the intake center. You, they're not coming from a medical facility. The child obviously has unusual circumstances that require some immediate attention. How do you deal with a family like so, that? So two things to focus on with, with that family. First, we've got um, home base in place to a much more robust uh, level than it had been in your days of doing constituent services. Uh, I remember getting calls from you. Uh, so there are a lot of mechanisms we have in place to keep people from losing their homes. I mean, I think as we've testified previously, we've driven down evictions 27 percent in New York City by increasing access to legal services and, and by providing additional rental assistance. We provided in excess of $200 million in rental assistance to prevent uh, people from losing their homes. Uh, and we have other mechanisms in that kind of case to prevent someone from having to come into shelter. Having said that, if that family were to come into shelter, uh, we have the ability for a family with children to, sh the state regulation uh, for single adult shelter provides for congregate shelter. For families with children, it provides for living units. And so we, we would have the capacity to shelter that family, although I would hope that our prevention first strategies would keep that family from having to enter shelter. Do any of these reasonable accommodation, accommodations extend to the older adult population? Uh, the reasonable accommodations apply to all, uh, under the Butler settlement, apply to all clients. All right. not, not limited by age. I think I testified in the spring about a um, population of seniors that we're seeing in the shelter system, and, and there's no dis differentiation between. Uh, uh, access for seniors for reasonable accommodations and access for non-seniors. 
Yeah, that's another population that needs to be looked at a little bit more closely because they come yeah. in with, you know, a uh, the, the unique individual set of circumstances and needs um, that are not necessarily being met um, with the current system. Just my last question, you mentioned in your testimony that DHS uh, has a new revised procedure for searching wheelchair users. What does that procedure look like? Um, what is the difference from how it used to be and what it is now? I think, and I'm gonna seek a little help from Commissioner Khaleesi, I think the major feature was that it provides for um, an appropriate way for somebody to be in a um, secure chair. So generally what happens is they've, in the past they've asked people to come out of their chair and that's difficult for people with disabilities to actually transfer. So there's a lot uh, that's going into redesigning this and it, well, working with PD to figure out what's the most appropriate way to get a person and search their chair correctly and make sure that someone isn't hiding something under their cushion or someone's hiding something in their wheelchair to be able to do that without them transferring. So it's about keeping the person in their chair and being able to search that chair appropriately for any type of, of contraband that may be in there. Do you use scanners? I mean, I think Corrections is like currently looking into scanners because they're easier to use. So what happens with a person in a wheelchair, the hard part is that it's hard to detect anything because of the metal on the wheelchair. So they can do the arms and parts of the body, but the scanners would pick up other areas of their wheelchair. So the idea is to be able to, how do you appropriately, appropriately check for that? So for instance, when I go through TSA security, they tend to examine me in the wheelchair in lots of different ways. They ask me to move to the side without transferring out. They pick up my legs uh, with assistance with, from me uh, to be able to do that. And if I can't, they ask how, what's the best way to do that. So those are the approaches that we're taking to talk and communicate with the person and be able to search the chair appropriately. And again, I would just want to emphasize that uh, what happened to Mr. Jones led to a change in policy and it, it should not have happened, uh, but we have a, a I think a more appropriate policy in place that reflects the insight that uh, Commissioner Khaleesi uh, just explained. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. I know that it is frustrating on both ends. I think that, you know, one of my, my, my bigger issues with, with government being a person in government uh, as a legislator and as a, as a civilian is the expediency by which, you know, these things uh, occur, um, you know, laying out five and ten year plans doesn't really do much to remediate existing conditions for, you know, day to day New Yorkers. And I think that's that, that's really frustrating. And the underlying, you know, I think issue here is we're, we're all trying to get to a point where we can, you know, comply with the law and, and do that in a rate and at a faster rate. And so I appreciate your efforts and thank you for testifying today. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Chair Levin. Thank you, Chair Ayala. Um, Thank you, Commissioner. So I guess I wanted to start with um, a little bit about uh, this policy from June 22nd of this year. Um, so can you share with us why, why was this necessary? And I'll, I'll, before you start, I'll read, I'll read all of the categories, just to be clear. It's, it's, it's pretty you know, easily under, able to be understood. Um, 10 questions or sorry, 12 questions. If you answer no to any of these questions, you are deemed not appropriate for shelter. So bathing, you have to be able to bathe self independently, may use devices such as shower, chair, and or grab bars. Dressing, dressing ind independently, retrieve all clothing, dress and undress, including shoes and outer garments. Grooming, groom self independently, including shaving, brushing teeth and hair, and other common grooming activities. Toileting, successfully completing toileting independently, including transferring and without, trans, including transferring and without supervision, preventing soiling of clothing and using toilet paper. May use raised toilet and or grab bars. Bowels, manage bowels, catheter, colostomy bags, or diapers independently without leaks. Bladder, control bladder functions without assistance, can include use of diapers, to control leaking or minimal incontinence. Transferring, independently transfer from wheelchair to bed and vice versa, may use elevated bed. Feeding, feed self independently, including for example, carrying food tray, opening common food or drink containers and cutting up on food. Mobility, independently ambulate or use cane, walker or propel a manual or motorized wheelchair. Communication, communication <coughs> spoken sign, visual, tactile language with or without an interpreter, cognition, 
understand direction and, and follow commands and make needs known, self-management, make manage key responsibilities associated with independent living, including medications and chronic illnesses. So if, if, if you answer no to any of those questions, you are deemed ineligible for shelter. So I guess my first question is this. Here's my first question. Could I interrupt you? Your assumption is not correct. I didn't you, make an assumption. You said if you answer any one of these questions, you're ineligible for shelter. Total, sco total points from answers. One point for each answer. Pa if score is less than 12, patient is not appropriate for shelter. Uh, I'm going to direct you to the rest of the document, which is um, the page, if you continue to the document, says absolute exclusion criteria, which is, which is the absolute exclusion cases. Sorry? If you look at the absolute exclusion cases, they're narrower than simply saying if you answer um, no to any of these questions. It's not an assumption. I'm reading here. I, I hear what you're saying. If but you I, answer no, you are not deemed appropriate for shelter. Is that right I, or not right? I, I, I think you're taking the, taking the, you're asking me questions out of the context of the document and what we're trying to get at. So this document is, so that's not right. If, you're le if you score less than 12, you may still be appropriate for shelter. Here, here's the answer I gave before, and, I, and I'd ask that you consider it. The purpose of this document was to prevent hospitals and nursing homes from dumping people from their operations into the shelter system. That's not a result that this committee has ever wanted. This policy has been in effect since 2010. We made a change that created fillable documents and created ways to expedite our decision making. If you look at the part of the document entitled Absolute Exclusion Criteria. What page is that? I'm, I'm, where's that? 10. Page 10. Appendix 1. It's Appendix 1. OK. So if you look at those categories, I'm sorry. I, Appendix one. Page two of Appendix one. Okay. All right. Absolute exclusion criteria. Okay. And just looking at these criteria, we could read through them. Pick anyone you, any ones you want. Okay. Need right. for home uh, care, visiting nurse service. Could I just finish? I think okay. if you look at them, you would say to yourself. Should any hospital or nursing home really be discharging somebody into congregate shelters established by state regulation with any of these conditions? Okay. And then I would ask you to look at the numbers that I recited earlier, which shows you that these are relatively small numbers of cases that the hospitals and nursing homes should be handling differently. Okay. Let's, we'll talk about the numbers in a second. How about need for home care or visiting nurse services beyond wound care or IMIV medication administration and beyond two weeks? So, okay, so you're saying that anybody that is, that is in need of home care or visiting nurse services, that's absolute exclusion. Because it's a congregate living environment. So, okay, I direct you to the Butler Settlement, page 15, miscellaneous, number three, under subdivision E, number three, allowing an applicant or recipient to bring a personal care attendant into shelter. Is that not, so that, Butler allows it, but, but under this rule or this provision, I, I don't know, is that different? Is a personal care attendant different from a visiting nurse? If so, how? How is a visiting nurse different from a personal care attendant? It's not an absolute prohibition, first of all. But Second, this is absolute it, exclusion could, criteria. Could I finish, please? Okay. The, uh, the procedure that you're referring to has been in place since 2010. It predates. Uh, the Butler settlement. Um, if there is a dispute between counsel for the plaintiffs and counsel for the city, I'm sure we'll work this out. The hearing is probably not the right place to do it. Okay, I'm not. I'm just referring to the to the Butler settlement. My question is this. This is my question. Under Callahan, is somebody with disabilities that might fall into one of the categories in Absolute Exclusion Appendix One? Or, I still don't quite understand this, why 12 doesn't equal 12, but checks no on any of the things that I just read into the record 
Are they, under Callahan, entitled to a right to shelter in New York City? As you know, I was counsel in Callahan for a number so of decades. You would know. And in that role, I had the same view that I have today as I sit here. Hospitals and nursing homes should not be dumping people into question. shelter. That's I'm a giving, policy. You have my answer. But that's not my question. My question is, does Callahan guarantee a right to shelter for everybody regardless of their disability status? When I was counsel in Callahan, I believed that hospitals and nursing homes should not dump people into shelter. The Callahan decree also permits the state to issue regulations. I litigated and lost arguments that the state could not issue regulations that would affect the underlying context of the decree. You might remember that in the early 90s. The state regulation does not permit us to provide shelter to people who have certain needs that are beyond those that can be served in shelter. We've referenced that regulation uh, in our testimony, and I'd be happy to go through with you that regulation. But the decree has a provision in it, I believe, and I have counsel here, I believe it's paragraph 10 or 12 that says the state has the ability to issue regulations. They issued a regulation during the course of the Callahan litigation that defined who was medically eligible for shelter. That's what's underlying the policy that's been in place in the city for a number of years with respect to uh, whether nursing homes or hospitals should dump people into the shelter system. So, okay, I, let's take a few steps back here. I'm a little bit unclear. What is this? What is this? Is this, this is, as I read it, DHS ADL assessment for institutional referrals. As I read those into the record, and then on the bottom it says, total points from answers. If score is less than 12, patient is not appropriate for shelter. Yep. So I do, I, the reason I ask is that somebody, some DHS employee, is conducting this assessment. No. If, no, who's conducting this assessment? This is an institutional discharge document. We're looking to have institutions give us the information so that we can, in our medical office, make appropriate determinations. This is not something that somebody sitting in an intake center is using as a document. Who's, who's filling this out? The hospital. Is the hospital or the nursing home. Correct. And, and, if, and if somebody scores a 10 because they can't independently transfer from wheelchair to bed and vice versa. Just, just I'm, I'm, I'm putting forward a, not just a hypothetical, but a probable outcome. I think your assumptions are wrong here. Cause I'm not, just, if I could finish. Someone scores a 10 on this. So whoever's filling out this form says, person scores 10, reads, if person is less scores less scores less than 12 patient is not appropriate for shelter therefore what that's my question therefore does the per what happens then what's next step okay as i said a, a moment or two ago this is not a document that an intake worker at 30th street is working with okay this is a worksheet to guide decisions made by the medical director of the agency in all cases the medical director confers with the hospital or the nursing home uh, in order to determine what's going to be the best outcome here. So the medical director, you, I'm sorry, you said the medical director is filling this out? No, I said the hospitals the hospital and the is nursing home is filling it out, and it is reviewed by our medical director's office, not by intake it's staff. It's reviewed by the medical director's office, and the medical director then... Hospitals so, have been filling out this form for years, Chair. This is a form that hospitals have been filling out for years, and it's an updated procedure Maybe and it's it always said to hospitals, if somebody can't transfer back and forth between a chair yes. independently and a bed, they are inappropriate to, they are, they are not appropriate for shelter. Uh, that is correct. I'm relying, in my answer, on advice of people that have worked for the agency when I was not working for the agency. Okay. But that has been, the, that, that has been a... I guess, a, maybe I could ask it a different could, way. Could I just finish? Sure. The, you, I know you're frustrated. But I'm, I'm this confused, is a document, frankly. but this is a document that has. This is the type of document that's been in use for a number of years, and it's not an intake document. It's a document to be filled out by hospitals and nurse and nursing homes 
to be reviewed by the medical office to determine whether or not under state regulations someone could be properly served in shelter. Okay. That state regulation was issued after the Callahan decree. The, re the procedure was in place before the Butler settlement. And if you look at the numbers that are involved here, you can see it's a small number of people who we believe the hospitals and nursing homes should come up with appropriate discharge planning for other than shelter. If, if somebody answers no to one of these, is it the position of DHS that they are not appropriate for shelter? It's the position of DHS, as I said, that the medical director will confer with the hospital to determine what's the best course of, con of course of. Well, why uh, doesn't it say that here then? Why does it say they're not appropriate for shelter instead of if score is less than 12, medical direct, please contact our medical director, here's the number. Right, if you were a hospital nursing home, wouldn't you always want to uh, uh, push somebody who, was a, who has significant needs onto us without having the kind of clarity that this document has been giving us well, for years? Well, this is, look, I, I, I don't, if somebody's being discharged from a hospital and they have no other place to go because they don't have a home, do I think that the hospital is the right setting for them? No. But do I think it's the responsibility of the hospital to find somebody a permanent affordable apartment using the resources of a hospital staff to find permanent affordable housing in New York City that is affordable? No, I don't think that that's even realistic. That's not even the ballpark of realistic. Like, but hospitals have discharge planning obligations. And you're saying that it is, it, but it's similar to the parole issue that you, we testified about before, remember? Which is, at the end of the day, don't you think that the state uh, 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 correctional uh, institution should do discharge planning so someone doesn't end up in shelter? I think that that's an ideal. I think that, or that's something to work towards. I would prefer that that, be a, that number be zero. But we live in the real world and there's times when people are being discharged from a hospital setting and don't have anywhere else to go. We are saying here that the Department of Homeless Services is saying not, not appropriate for shelter. I, just, I, I, I guess the, the question really to me is, when I read this, does DHS really believe that somebody who can't carry their own food tray for whatever reason, therefore answering no, scoring 11 on this, is not appropriate because that's what it says in black and white. We, we find that when we push back in these cases that the hospitals come up with other alternatives that are appropriate for the individual, such as OPWDD, for example. Okay. How is... I mean, I'm just going, just going back to that absolute exclusion document. How is, how is the need for a home care visiting nurse as an absolute exclusion consistent with the settlement of Butler? I'm, I'm, not, I don't, I, I'm not really asking about Butler here. I'm asking about the absolute exclusion criteria. In other words, if this predates Butler, then ought not this be changed? to be in accordance with the Butler settlement? First of all, Butler applies to all populations. The original plaintiffs were adult families. The, um, the, we, as I said before, we have a, the ability to accommodate such households uh, in families with children uh, and adult families because the regulatory structure provides for non-congregate settings. In a congregate setting, it's led us so far this year to have 15 cases that we push back on, 13 from hospitals, two from nursing homes. We think it's the better approach to avoid shelter being the default and to look to other systems that exist to provide services to just the kind of individual that you described. And so the hospital is well situated to do that. For example, uh, some of the state systems. If somebody is, is if somebody is turned away from shelter, you're you're you have the you're you're where postulating do they go? somebody. Where are they going? You're postulating somebody coming in the middle of the night and being turned away from shelter, but you're asking. That's never me, happened. 
Not, on, not through this document. This document is a hospital discharge, nursing home discharge document. Did that not happen to Ms. Amparo? I, is, is, you're saying that that's never happened? Ms. Amparo's case was mishandled between HRA and DHS, and we put in place a process to avoid having that happen. So it does not or will not happen where somebody is turned away from intake because they don't meet a criteria that's laid out on this form. This form is a form that is used with a hospital. It's not an individual's form where they're coming in and applying for shelter. It's a form designed to make the hospitals focus on getting people to the best locations. It's a form that's used to focus on getting nursing homes to get people to the best locations. So it's not a form that's designed if someone should come in in the middle of the night. If a hospital does discharge somebody that does not meet all these criteria, because that happens a couple, 1,700 times a year, 1,200 times a year? No, um, that, isn't, that wasn't my testimony. You said 1,268 was the number of discharges from hospitals. Uh, uh, wait a DHS. minute. DHS. Those are the cases we took in. Those are the cases that came in your front door, discharged from hospitals. That we accepted. Right. I'm saying that of those, if, if one of those, I'm sorry, if one of those does not meet your criteria, what, what is then the next step? Where do they go then? As, for example, this year, there were, there were, so far this year, there have been 13 cases from hospitals and two cases from uh, uh, nursing homes. They did not discharge them to us. They found other solutions for people and other systems. You're... What, like um, what? Imagining, for example, uh, how about OP? Uh, uh, Office of People with Developmental Disabilities. So, not a single person then that is discharged from a hospital or nursing home that is deemed ineligible because they're not meeting a criteria here is turned away to the street. Is that right? If they were to come to our intake center, we would take them in and we would deal with the consequences of the hospital that improperly discharged such a person the next day. And if they're referred from the hospital? We are going to tell the hospital they should find a better alternative, and that has been what we believe is happening. And if the hospital still discharges them to DHS? We think that that's very wrong. We would take them in. Do that as it may. Would, we would take them in and we would use uh, the kinds of services that we think are appropriate. For example, nursing homes, uh, you know, can refer to Sydney for an Olmstead subsidy. There are other systems that exist besides the shelter system that hospitals and nursing homes should be making use of. So you're saying it has never happened that DHS has turned somebody away to the street or an ER, and it will not happen in the future? I'm trying to be careful with your questions because you're setting up a situation which why should any hospital not just dump clients on us because you're saying you're you're putting us in a position to say even when they violate our let me finish even when they violate their own discharge policies if they should happen to show up on on our doorstep we should provide shelter to them what I'm pushing back to you and I would hope you would join us in pushing back is that this is a hospital and nursing home issue the department of homeless services is trying to deal with the fact that other, other entities push clients to us when they should be addressing their needs directly. Okay, I, I've been working, I mean, I, I promised I wouldn't bring up medical respite in this hearing, but I've been working with the hospitals and with NILAG for a few years now on trying to come up, because they came to me and said, we, ha we can't just hold on to people forever and ever and ever because we, don't, because we can't find them in a place to go, because they're homeless, because they don't have a place to, because, because they, there's no, nobody wants to be homeless in the first place. Nobody wants to be in shelter in the first place. Everybody would much rather have some place else to go. Sometimes people with disabilities fall into that category where they have no other place to go and my question to you is, are they, do they have a right to shelter? Whether they're discharged from a hospital or they walk in your front door, 
do they have a right to shelter? I think the data that I gave you before shows you that we are in fact taking people who are discharged by hospitals and discharged by nursing homes. It also shows you that when we believe that under the congregate shelter structure established by state regulation, that under state regulation we can't provide appropriate services, we're going to push back hard on hospitals and nursing homes. Okay. Um, can we talk about what, what so what happened with barrier-free living? There was a shelter that had 32 beds that was specifically designed to uh, accommodate people in need of assistance for ADL. And uh, that was the only one in the city. And it closed. It had been in existence for 20 years, since the early 90s, I think. Uh, why? Why was that closed? And why would the city allow such a necessary program close without some type of replacement program? So if, if they weren't running a good program or they were in an inappropriate facility, why didn't we with all of our great resources and our $90 billion budget, find another place to open. So first, Barry Free uh, is a great organization. It's done great work over the years. The individuals that were there, all of the individuals that were there at the time when it was going to be closed were connected to permanent housing except two clients who ended up in shelter, uh, in other accessible shelter that work for their needs. So for the clients that were there at the time of closure, they ended up with, with, with as we would think would be appropriate outcomes in terms of being connected to permanent housing. Uh, the building was unsafe. It had to be closed. Uh, and we work with Barrier Free Living to try to find other locations. Uh, we are anxious to have them develop the shelter on the site that uh, they had the building and we welcome them to provide us with another uh, request for proposal so that we can uh, fund them to run a shelter. Uh, I think, as you know, I sent a letter to every elected official, uh, every council member that is, every community board looking for more sites uh, and any site that we could get that would be appropriate for barrier free living, we'd be happy to have them open a new shelter at a site that that how many sites that. were identified? I mean, we're, 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 it, Very uh, few elected officials have identified sites as a result of that communication. Well, with all due respect, DHS has the resources to identify sites. They do it all the time because they open up shelters. That's so correct, and we have. We, a, I'm. I don't have. I have a staff of six. So and they're you know they're not like we're not we're not real estate agents so we don't know of every site that might be available. You guys have a better handle on finding sites than we do. Right. You have the track record to do right. that. I think, as you know, our process works mainly by not-for-profit providers identifying sites and bringing them to us, or in some cases, um, uh, landlords have identified sites and brought them to us. That's how we've got 21 sites cited. Uh, and again, we're... But how come we one of those 21 wasn't for barrier-free living? Uh, some of them were families with children's sites, as you know. Some of them were adult family sites, as you know. Some of them are mental health shelters, as you know. There's a need for many kinds of shelters that we have. Uh, I think I testified previously about the urgency of bringing on more mental health uh, shelter beds. We've opened uh, several shelters recently, and we have more uh, slated to open and to provide mental health beds. So we, we're in a system with many needs uh, that we're trying to meet at the same time, and we stand ready to work with Barrier Free if there's anything we can do to help them identify sites. Five months now. What's the plan moving forward? Uh, the plan moving forward is to continue to evaluate any proposal that they might submit to us. Uh, we want to also focus on the reality of our shelter system which is that we have limitations under state regulation as to who we can house. But 
we certainly will work with them to find any sites that, well, that I mean, to I know work that with any my, site that they have. My good friend Ben Kalos, uh, good good colleague Ben Kalos and, and his community in Roosevelt Island identified a site that was turned down. Right, well that site was being used for another uh, a challenging population as well at Kohler. And, 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 but it was, why was that? I thought it was rejected. I heard it was rejected because it was in a floodplain of some kind or that it was, it had, it had evacuation issues. If we're talking about the same site, Kohler Hospital has people in it right now who have had very serious needs. So it was rejected because it was being used by another program? Yeah. There's no free space available? That's not, that was not my understanding. My There's understanding no space available that's available to us to use for that, for this population. It seems to me that while there's priorities all over the place, I get it, this is a, ought to be a top priority, therefore taking precedent over other priorities. I'm not sure you would agree if we said we weren't gonna open a mental health shelter uh, in order to, uh, provide a site to well, barrier free. Well, I would say a, a general population shelter. We have clients that have general population needs too. Right, but this is a, this is a specific need where the program that was the only program in the city meeting that need is now closed and not offering a very specific, very needed service for 32 beds. It seems to me that, that you know, a general population shelter is a lower priority on the list. Because you got to make decisions, you got to prioritize. You, you're right, and we have to make those decisions every night, running a shelter system, particularly with winter approaching, to make sure we have enough capacity every is night. Is there a plan? To a is, the 90 new shelters is 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 this replacement as one of the 90 new shelters plan? Our ability to open the 90 new shelters is dependent upon not-for-profit shelter providers coming to us with proposals. I have said in this testimony, and Barrier Free w Living knows this, they have a site in which they could develop one of the 90 shelters on, period. They have a site they could develop one of the 90 shelters on. I mean, Barrier Free Living is a really important part in the community. I was uh, considered for shelter when I originally got injured, and I worked with Paul m several times to, on, on issues and everywhere that we can be helpful. I think what the commissioner is saying is we'd love to build on that existing site, and correct me if I'm wrong, if he brings the proposal forward and we're able to do that, I think that's a viable, one viable option. I don't want to see barrier-free living go away. They provide services and allow PCAs to be in there. Uh, Paul's been a great part of uh, the community, and uh, we want to see it succeed. And the, the, the place is where are we going to put it, what's viable, and if the, if the good solution is brought forward to us, I believe that we will jump on top of that. Okay. The commissioner said it much more succinctly than I had tried to say it. They've got a site. They can develop a site. If they want to get another site, they can come to us with another site. If we have an appropriate site for them to open a second site, we're happy to do that. They're a great organization. And I'd be happy to work with, uh, with Commissioner John this as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my, my colleague, Councilmember Holden, um, and then I'll I'll come back for some more questions. With oh, and uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Adrian Adams as well. Yes, thank you. So it's it sounds like just following up a little bit. It sounds like the um, providers are not really making proposals uh, to you um, to uh, accommodate the um, people with disabilities. Is that? True? Uh, absolutely not. We just opened a, a met, we have a mental health shelter we're about to open in the next uh, couple of weeks. We've just opened two of them. We're, we're getting a lot of excellent proposals for the kinds of shelters that we need to open. I think the questioning from Council Member Levin was focused on one particular provider, one particular shelter, which as Com uh, Commissioner Khaleesi said, we value them greatly. We've given them land to develop, a, you know, they have land they could develop a new shelter on. And if they bring us another proposal, we're happy to, to work with them. So I, I, if I, okay. I didn't want to leave you the impression that. All right, that no, I just, that, you know, I'm just trying to get, you know, I was listening. I'm, I'm trying to decipher some of it. Um, however, um, we do have providers that actually tell uh, the clients, the homeless, that they have to leave during the day, right? We, that they have to go, they, can, not, they have to come back at night. Uh, no. 
Uh, one of the first things we did during the 90-day review was to eliminate that directive from the prior administration, uh, and the shelters cannot require people to leave during the day. However, in the faith-based shelters that we you know, help, they help us bring people in off the streets, those shelters that uh, uh, faith-based uh, organizations operate, uh, they operate as uh, religious facilities during the day and they're unavailable to our clients. It's the reason why we don't open shelters, in uh, ongoing shelters in faith-based facilities. We use beds to help bring people off the street. And you identify, I think, a really important uh, issue here, which is we want to make sure that we don't have people out on the street during the day. Okay. Um, to follow up, could you, um, get, getting back to this form again, this, um, and it says on the top, it says to be completed by a healthcare facility staff only. Um, so they fill this out. And do, have you heard of any nursing home or hospital t discharging um, a person, in a, let's say in a wheelchair, um, just putting them out on the street? Have you heard of that? Uh, no, I recall when I used to be a legal aid lawyer that I had cases where that happened, but I have, we have not seen those happening now. Now, you said that the, the nursing home and, or the hospital should have uh, other alternatives to the shelter system. What are they? Are they could you give us a, a few? Let's say a nursing home said we, we, have, we have to now discharge this person. Well, I think as Commissioner Khaleesi said, there are state programs for people. There are state, but th let's say um, they run into obstacles there. I mean, I don't know how many facilities there are. Um, the idea is to keep them close to home where yep. they have some, yep. some support. Are there enough facilities? Well, sometimes though, again, facilities? looking at the numbers of people that we're finding are not, uh, don't meet the standard for being able to provide shelter, it's a relatively small number of people and we do find on a case-by-case -case basis and that's the important thing to, to I want to make sure that the, it's fairly clear on the record we're not talking about hundreds or thousands we're talking about handful of cases in which frequently the focus on the case once we've said hey the shelter is really not right for that person there are family solutions there are you know other things that can be brought to bear in terms of Medicaid to give the kind of help but I think it's part of the issue here there's not a one-size-fits-all uh, uh, policy Okay, thank you. Chair. I would like to recognize Council Member Adams. You had a question? I wasn't necessarily going to ask this question, but I'll ask it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Council Member. Good afternoon, Commissioner. How Good are afternoon, you today? everyone that's come out uh, today. Um, in, in sitting here listening uh, to the testimony so far and, and just coming in, it, it just comes to mind, Commissioner, the number of um, individuals who are homeless with disabilities who are panhandling. Um, does DHS take any type of responsibility or posture? Uh, on our um, vulnerable um, individuals with disabilities who are out in number, uh, panhandling on service roads and sidewalks and, and so on? Uh, yes. Uh, we are, I think, as, as you know, we have street outreach teams in all five boroughs out 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. Uh, through their efforts on the front lines, they've brought in from the streets 1,815 people. Uh, we use safe havens as a way to do that, and we certainly are very focused on the needs of people who are on the streets that have disabilities. But some of the people, and, and you and I have looked at this together, are people that have a place to go, um, and they're panhandling, and our uh, Homestead approach is to try to assess everybody on the street to determine whether or not they have some place to go and offer them services. One of the things that we, we certainly want to do is connect people to our HRA job uh, uh, training services to see if that helps someone meet their economic needs, if they're housed and, and panhandling nonetheless. If they're unhoused and panhandling, we want to bring them in off the street, and that's really what our focus is. So um, uh, I know we're going to get out and take a look at the end of the subway line together soon. Uh, in your district, and I think we can, you know, maybe together see if there are other things we can be doing. Okay, terrific. Uh, speaking of the subway, and I wasn't even thinking about the gentleman, we do have a staple 
<laughs> at Jamaica Station who is in a wheelchair um, that I greet every morning and every evening. Um, I would imagine also it, it would be a, a matter of some type of uh, outreach via enforcement and a lot of other things also. My, my priority is always safety, so I'm always worried about um, these individuals and the fact that cars can hit them or they may not be able to move as quickly as others and that type of thing. So I'm just c concerned for their safety and, and overall well-being. Right. I mean, our first priority is addressing uh, people who are on the streets and bring them in inside. And that's, I think, the success we've been having with Homestead so far. Yeah. Thank you. Right. I should also point out we've got um, assess accessible capacity for people in wheelchairs in our safe havens. So um, perhaps when we're together, we can convince that individual to come in. Okay. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Yeah. I have a quick question. So it, only because it, it keeps coming up um, as part of the hearing. So last night, as, uh, as Council Member Levin uh, mentioned, my daughter had a baby and I was visiting. And as I was coming out with my other grandchildren who were running around driving me nuts, I realized that there was a gentleman smack in the middle of the exit to the hospital in a wheelchair with both legs wrapped and his belongings. And he appeared to have been there for, for a really long time. And so I don't doubt that hospitals are discharging, you know, uh, homeless folks and just, you know, sending them directly to you when maybe it may not be medically appropriate. And I wonder, is there a tracking uh, do you, does DHS track what hospitals um, individuals are coming from? Is there like? Yeah, I mean the the discharge form um, that Councilmember Holden referred to for hospital personnel to fill out. We do track where where people are coming from and where there are uh, disputes about discharges. Uh, offline, I'd be interested in following up with you about the hospital where your daughter. Yeah, I'd appreciate uh, Heather, baby, that. congratulations so we can find Thank out you. what might happen with that case. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll just ask another question about barrier free living. Is DHS open to them proposing exactly the same model as they've operated for the last 25 years? In other words, with uh, assistance for, for people with ADLs? Um, open to whatever they're going to propose. We've had shelters that we've opened where the proposal originally might have looked on its face as something we couldn't do, and then working with the provider, we've come up with something we could do. So I would encourage them or anyone else to propose whatever they think they could contribute to helping us address homelessness, and as part of the negotiations, we'll work out the model. So, okay, just want to make this very clear because I think there seems to be some confusion. So. So the model that they operated, which provided assistance, provided help with people that need assistance with their ADLs, that is, that is entirely a model that DHS is supportive of in the future. And we would encourage them, if they're going to put in another application, to propose a, a, a model that is, that is the same model that they have operated thus far. As you know, there are procurement issues here. Right. Anybody, not just, not just them. I welcome I mean, anybody. The, the model itself, I think the model is the question. It's not about barrier free living. It's we, 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 we are supportive of a model that, um, provide, that allows for people that need assistance with ADLs. Um, we are open to any proposal for any need that, that anybody thinks that could, we could serve better in the shelter system. Any proposal that will help us address the goals of Butler uh, we're open to it, and then we're going to be subject to negotiations between the provider and us about whether the model actually works under state regulation. But the shelter was operating. They had a way of approaching it. I think, as Commissioner Khaleesi said, uh, I have great regard for, for uh, Paul and what he's done over the years. If it wasn't for the building safety, they would still be operating today. I'll, and, I'll, and if that proposal comes through, I'll be sure to be part of the process. Okay. Um, just going back to the alternatives to DHS. So this is, I still am unclear. Somebody is discharged, is flagged as not getting 12 out of 12, or flagged as needing a home health aid, uh, and is thus 
I mean, automatically excluded. What, what are the, the, you mentioned some alternative options for people in, in, uh, for, for housing through discharge. You mentioned Ol Olmstead. Right, I think as you, as you know, and many members of the council know, we often get involved when uh, Medicaid, Medicaid managed care services, which as you know, we don't run, but we do make, uh, we do have input into de determinations. Uh, we often get involved when Medicaid managed care uh, might be denying services to somebody for the kind of home care help that they may need. Uh, you know, the, in a lot of cases, there are other systems problems that re result in, in a determination by a hospital or nursing home to say, oh, there's no choice but to send them to shelter. Um, again, I want to just go back through the numbers. In 2016, there were 1,268 discharges from hospitals. Commissioner, there's no need to reiterate the numbers. Almost we, we all be of out of them were accepted I don't want to reiterate shelter. anything. But Almost I do want to say, though, is that I've shelter. heard that, that OPWDD and Olmstead are not truly available housing options. That the application process for Olmstead, housing through Olmstead, is a year or two long process. So obviously we can't expect a hospital to keep somebody for a year waiting for an application to go through. That is not appropriate. I, the, the question raises, who's, who, the, we say we don't want DHS to be the place of last resort. That's what DHS is. DHS is the place of last resort for everybody. Nobody it's not, the, it's, not the, it's not the ideal option for anybody that goes in. The 60 some odd thousand people that are in DHS shelter, it is, I guarantee you, it's not their first option, as you know. I mean, look, the, the administration overall is certainly aware of and focused on finding a long-term sustainable solution for this group of New Yorkers who are homeless who need ongoing medical services. This is a problem that predates both of us, you and I, in our current roles, and it's something that the administration is very focused on. Uh, obviously, I'm acutely aware every night that DHS is the place of last resort. Uh, we have hearings sometimes about whether or not the number of people who are seeking shelter as a last resort, whether that number is right. As you know, we've been able to hold that flat for the first time in, in a decade. But as administration overall, we are very much aware of this issue, um, and we're going to uh, come up with solutions for it. But in the meantime, if someone were to come to us on any given night, we're going to do the best we can to make sure that the person doesn't end up in the street. And meanwhile, we're going to keep working with the hospitals and nursing homes to address their needs. Having someone with these kinds of needs in a shelter for a year isn't a good solution either for that individual. So as an administration writ large, well, we're going I would to argue look that for it's better, better solutions. Than living on the street. Absolutely, but but listen, as you know, we we have people out 24/7 bringing people in. If we see any indication of hospital discharges or people that are being discharged from nursing homes onto the street, we're going to take action. I don't have that. I don't have that kind of information here today, as I testify. Okay. I mean, I think that empirically, any New Yorker sees people living with disabilities on the street. We all see that. So we know that there are people with disabilities living on the street. But those are two, two different issues. One is whether or not there are people with disabilities on the street and we're spending an, a tremendous amount of resources to bring them in and that's how we've been brought in and the number of people are brought in. The other issue is whether or not people are being turned away from DHS intake and ending up on the streets. As to the first one, I completely agree with you. We're putting in tremendous resources to bring people in from the streets, however they got there. As to the second one, however, the policy that's been in place in the city since 2010, requiring hospitals to uh, work with the DHS medical director to make sure a discharge are, is appropriate, is something that uh, is not a one-size-fits-all, and it's a case-by-case -case analysis. So uh, we've got to keep on uh, moving along here, because we, we do have to be out of here in a little bit, in about an hour. So. Just have two other points I want to raise. Okay. First is we've heard a lot of complaints about connecting to permanent housing resources 
people that are in the shelter system today that require assistance with ADL, getting into affordable housing units that may have a set aside for people with disabilities. So the connection to, uh, to the affordable housing stock that's there is we're seeing, we're, we're hearing that there's a problem there. Well, the 7% of all new affordable housing is set aside for people with disabilities, 5% for mobility, 2% for hearing and vision. And we are just about getting rid of those right now that people are there. Um, the problem is that affordable housing uh, isn't affordable for people that are coming, uh, that are on Medicare, right? They're making $9,000 a month. So the idea is how do we figure out how to get people with disabilities and bridge that gap, right? Because right. $24,000 and $9,000 here. What right. type of subsidies are available to be able to do that? Yeah. Well, right, there is, um, there, there is Section 8 housing that is available. That, that certainly raises that up. But then, there, then there's a problem with hitting the developer. Will they accept that? So that's um, what, what we're working with right now mm -hmm. with Housing Preservation Development to figure out what we can do to, to actually bridge that gap, because that gap right. is the big problem. In conjunction with that, we Perhaps also- Perhaps a voucher could work. What's that? Perhaps a voucher could work. A, a voucher could work as well. But it's also about doing the education with the developers to ensure that they're able to do that, which is always a process, right? Mm -hmm. And it's something that HPD is being com is committed to doing, um, along with filling that 7%. But once that 7% is full, what do we really have? Right. And, and, and that's the bigger issue, right? It's this housing stock. How, how do we figure out how to raise that to 10% or even 15% in that affordable housing? Well, these are the issues that we do have, Council Member. Or we I, could, I'm with you on this. Or we could raise the set aside for, for formerly homeless, too, is one thing, and, and, and maybe that could also create some availability within. Well, I'm working under the disability context, yeah. and, and, that, and that's where I am. And so how do we do that? I mean, my goal is to figure out how to raise it to at least 10% and also get developers to be able to take that voucher, to take that Section 8, whatever that may be, is important. In conjunction with that, we want to keep people with disabilities out. We have an NYC at Work initiative to try to get people mm -hmm. with disabilities employed throughout the city, and also an empowered NYC program that allows people to get resources to figure out that they can figure out what they can do to get housing, um, what they can do to get uh, to bridge that gap. Bridge the gap. I mean, I mean and that's, that, that's what we're working with. And our Empowered NYC is a newly launched program, and we're meeting people where they're at. And if you yep. have people that you know that need that type of financial empowerment, we'd be happy to work with you. Bridging that gap may require some, some, some support, some financial right. support. Right. It, it's certainly a financial support that yep. it, I, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with you. We have to bridge that gap. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Okay, last, last question or series of questions. With people that are currently in shelter, how are we tracking, how are we tracking, uh, is that tracked through CARES? People that require assistance with ADL, is that, is that tracked in CARES? Do we know how many people in shelter today require assistance with ADL? And then how are reasonable accommodation requests tracked? Are those tracked in the care system? Yeah, I think as we found when we went from 90 reasonable accommodations to 46,000 reasonable accommodations at HRA that we needed to build a, a system to be able to do that, and that's one of the things that we're doing. Sorry, we would say that again? You went from 90 I, I to... Said when we, one of the things we learned that in order to go from 90 reasonable accommodations at HRA when I started for HRA clients to currently 46,000 reasonable accommodations that we needed to build. In the HRA system on benefits. It, that we, right, but that we need to build a system to be able to track. Okay. and so CARES is not adequate. It's not, it's, we're, we're building out a system to be able to do it more effectively. Okay. Um, and, okay, now what happens when somebody presents that they need assistance with ADL and they're in shelter currently, a single adult shelter. What, what happens then? Are they, are, they, are they transferred to a shelter that uh, uh, is more accessible? Or would you sh share with us what is the process when somebody presents that? I mean, like, again, in, in the context of being 10 months into the Butler settlement, the process is to um, assess the need grant reasonable accommodations and, uh, and implement them. But again, I wanna level set with you that we're 10 months into 
reforming a 40-year system that hasn't met these needs very well. Um, so what happens if somebody, okay, what happens if somebody uh, requires uh, assistance between, you know, uh, uh, requires a home health aid, requests a home health aid if they're in, if they're in shelter today? We're going to try to meet those needs as, as best we can. Obviously, for families with children and adult families, we have the ability to do that, to meet those needs now. Right, and for more focused single, on single adults. Right. We're talking but about for, for single adults, we have to be able to build a capacity to, to meet those needs and to focus on how quickly we can move people out who may have those needs. But again, we're 10 months in to reforming um, a system that has needed reform. How about service animals? Are service animals uh, allowed in shelter? Uh, yes, and you can see it's in the menu specifically with respect to that. Um, what is the mechanism in place um, for shelter residents to report complaints that they have around this issue? If, if somebody um, is requesting assistance with ADL and feels that they're not getting that assistance, from DHS, what's the method by which they can make that complaint? I mean, there's two ways. One is the part that we have ownership for, which is our, our info line complaint mechanism, where we use that to field complaints with respect to HRA reasonable accommodations and have built it up as a robust way to do that. Mm -hmm. And now that's available for people in the DHS system as well. And then there's the informal relief system that was set up as one of the deliverables that I mentioned in response to Council Member Ayala's question uh, with the Legal Aid Society. Uh, uh, do shelter residents have a posted bill of rights? Uh, yes, they do. Um, specifically about... And specifically, one of the rights is the right to make complaints. Um, Councilman Ayala asked about beds, but I just, just want to follow up on that. Do people, do, do people in shelter, if requested, have access to a motorized bed if they need it as a, as a, a condition of uh, needing assistance with an ADL? I need a little consultation. In other words, a bed that can be raised and lowered using a button, not a manual crack, be because a person with a severe disability wouldn't be able to <coughs> raise or lower the bed independently we, using a manual, independently using a manual crank. Right. We we have through Medicaid done that in the past. You have, and that can and it's but only through Medicaid. So somebody has to have a Medicaid case in order to do that. Uh, if. We haven't encountered a situation in which we haven't been able to do it through Medicaid. Obviously, as Butler proceeds, there may be a, a, greater, a greater need. Okay. Uh, are, are, does every shelter have bathrooms that are ADA accessible as defined that it's large enough for an individual to close the door behind them with their <coughs> walker or wheelchair inside the stall and or a room to still have enough space to turn themselves around to use the toilet? Let me give you some information on that, but also it's important to remember that the settlement specifically provides for the hiring of an expert, an independent expert that was approved by the Legal Aid Society, to take that kind of accounting mm -hmm. and that that becomes right. the basis. You mentioned select shelters. I don't know how they're selected. They were selected through a process in which we consulted with plaintiff's counsel, and it, they were selected in order to give us a baseline so that we could evaluate the system and then continue to evaluate as we go on. The purpose of the Butler settlement, remember, is that to have an accessible system, which is different than every particular unit being assessed, uh, I can give you right now the following information, remembering the Earlier in the testimony, I said to you that the need for air conditioning was a significant need. So we currently have uh, 134 locations where there's air conditioning, and we have 184 locations where there's wheelchair accessibility. Uh, Out of how many? Uh, the total number of buildings we have is 469, but remember, many of those are clusters. Yep which we are closing, and as I said in the testimony, 
getting out of clusters is an important part got it. of I, coming into Sorry, compliance. we, we got to be out. So I just got two more questions here. Of the 11 new shelters built by the city, are they all outfitted with ADA accessibility? Right, the, the shelters aren't built by the city. The, city. the shelters are proposed by not-for-profit providers. We have not built any of these shelters. Of the 15 that are open and operating, 12 of them were uh, opened under new certificates of opera, uh, CFOs, and therefore they must meet all accessibility requirements. Mm -hmm. Three of them are operating under older uh, AD, uh, certificates of occupancy, but they'll be looked at as part of the consultant's assessment of our new shelters, whether or not what we need to do with those particular three. Okay. My last question, I think you've answered this before, but I just want this clear and on the record. Does DHS intend to stop serving people who require assistance with ADL? You know, we spent about two hours talking about this topic. Yep. And in my lifetime, I've asked a lot of yes or no questions. And sometimes when witnesses say, I just talked about this for two hours, Mostly the judges say, well, that's probably right. So I talked about it for two hours. It's a much more nuanced answer than yes or no. I don't know that it is. If, honestly, if, I'm a little concerned that you can't answer no to that. I, if, if you are still asking as a yes or no question, I'm concerned about the last two hours of testimony in which I said to you, we are reforming access to our shelters through a Butler settlement, which is undoing 40 years of, a, of problematic access. Uh, we have a five-year timeline to do that. We have, uh, are eliminating a one-size-fits-all approach. We have hospital-based forms that are filled out that focus on ADLs. We have a, a iterative process between our medical director and hospital. If somebody scores, it's not a no answer. It is not your, your, your that is an unfair characterization of two hours worth of testimony. No, 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 that's, no, no, the answer, no, that's, it's a positive thing. What you're describing, the, the question was, does DHS intend to stop serving people that require assistance with ADL? What you just answered was, no, we don't, it seems like you're saying we don't intend to stop serving people that require assistance with ADL. I just want to make sure that that is, that, that, that should be a, a pretty easy one. It, it, it's not an easy one because the reason why we've been having so much of this back and forth is that it's not a one size fits all. There are some people we're currently serving who need ha help with ADLs. There are some people who we couldn't serve in a congregate setting who need help with ADLs. So the implication from a lot of the questions is that we've made a policy change to stop serving people with ADLs. We have not made a policy change. However, that doesn't mean that for many, many years there's been a focus on people who have ADLs that cannot be served in a congregate setting that we haven't pushed back hard on hospitals and nursing homes when they attempt to discharge people who can't be served in a congregate shelter setting under state regulation. As I said earlier, though, the city writ large understands that this is a challenge for people that need medical care who are homeless. Uh, and we are committed to coming up with a solution for that. That doesn't mean that the solution is the shelter system. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, everybody, for your testimony. And we'll take uh, 30 seconds, but I'll call up the first panel here. Robinson Paolo, Elizabeth Corallo, Dustin Jones, and Ada Cologne. I encourage the administration, commissioners, if you could uh, potentially stay to listen to some testimony, that would be greatly appreciated.
just like to make clear, as per previous negotiation, the commissioner. Commissioner yes. Banks does have to leave at 3.30, so we acknowledge that, but I'm grateful that he can stay no. until that time. So they're going to ask, they're going to ask questions, that's it? Well, you're going to, you're going to give your testimony, so kind of like a summary of all right. the, that document you right. need, and then, uh, yeah, and then, um, yeah, we'll do that. All right, no problem. Good call. I'm going to ask them to go take some time. Okay, whoever wants to begin. My name is Elizabeth Corallo, and I've been dealing with the shelter system since the hospital released me to the shelter four months ago. At the shelter, they discriminated against me by denying me shelter more than four times, each time being sent back to the hospital and the hospital sending me back for the reason that my disability is paralysis from the waist down due to an accident. I told the BRC street outreach team at Penn Station that the shelter refused to accept me. They took my case stating that the shelter was the only intake shelter with wheelchair access and that it was illegal if I was denied. So BRC drove me to Franklin and after arguing with the intake staff, I was eventually let in the shelter. Once inside the shelter, I faced other barriers. I was stuck not being able to even shower or get in my bed. I was denied the right to have a home health aid for my condition because they said those are the rules and stipulations of DHS. When my roommates saw the problems I was having, they offered to help. However, the guards in the shelter said if anyone was caught helping me shower, then they would kick me out. I didn't want to end up on the streets with me in this condition. I was eventually transferred to another shelter under the false promise that it would be better suit my needs and allow me to have a home health aid and get physical therapy. That was untrue. At that shelter, I spent days sleeping in my wheelchair because the bed was higher than my chair and I couldn't slide into it. Also, I spent days without showering and weeks because I needed help with that task. DHS visited me personally to talk about my needed accommodations and transferred to a more appropriate facility, but they didn't do anything to help. They said that they couldn't. Eventually, I was hospitalized after an assault by another client and was moved from the hospital to another shelter. Still, the same problems arose. I cannot shower because I need an aid. I'm held prisoner by staff because I cannot travel alone. Constantly going to the hospital because DHS will not help me access my medications or catheter bags. I have also had medications stolen by shelter staff. I am in bad condition in DHS's hands. I have asked to be put in a physical rehab program. I've been denied even for a transfer to a medical facility. Something must be done. This is not fair. Well, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll, we'll ask some follow-up questions for the whole panel. Hello, my name is Susan Dua. I'm the executive director of Center for Independence of the Disabled New York. And I'm here testifying for Dustin Jones. I'm providing his statement. In summary, he's unable to be here because of the conditions in his shelter today. Uh, thank you for this invitation to appear before the New York City Council to describe my experiences in the New York City shelter system, focusing on the shelter system's inaccessibility. My name is Dustin Jones. I have a physical, ex I have a physical disability and I'm a longtime advocate. Until July 2017, I lived in an apartment in the Bronx. My roommate's behavior caused us to lose the apartment. From July until September 2017, I rented rooms thinking that I would find housing quickly. However, that was not the case. I entered the Department of, For of Homeless Services shelter in September, having run out of options. In September, I began to be housed on Wards Island. From there, I went to a Canvas shelter for four days and was placed on October 25th in the Clark Thomas shelter on Wards Island. I'm going to be speaking about my experiences at Clark Thomas because that's where I've had the most experience. My experiences, however, are not unique and other shelters have the same conditions as well. As a wheelchair user, my federal, state, and local civil rights and human rights have been repeatedly violated. I faced discrimination in a variety of ways for more than a year. There is no process in place for me to get a reasonable accommodation. The hospital that discharged me to my shelter 
wrote in my notes in early February that I needed a special bed because of my wounds. I was told that DHS was working on it. There is one person with disabilities who's severely obese and has a wider bed provided. This is the only exception I have seen that is made for a person because of a disability. Residents are advised that they can obtain reasonable, are not advised that they can obtain reasonable accommodations or how to do so. They are not told how to complain if they do not get reasonable accommodations. I do not have a bed that I can get in and out of. The bed is lower than my wheelchair seat. This means I could easily fall and become injured while attempting to transfer into the bed. It also means that once I'm in bed, I can't safely transfer into my wheelchair seat. This has necessitated my sleeping in my chair. As a result, I've been hospitalized for infected stage three pressure sores three times since I've been at Clark Thomas. These sores, which risk my health, were obtained at Clark Thomas, and so was the infection. The sores are not getting better because I am unable to lie down. I need a bed that raises or lowers or is at the height of my wheelchair seat so I can transfer safely. Also, there are not enough outlets next to the beds for people who have power chairs and cannot they therefore cannot charge their chairs at night. For those who attempt to charge them during the day, they need to be able to charge long enough for their chair to hold the charge for long enough. People with physical disabilities, approximately 25 of us, are housed on the first floor because there are stairs to the upper floors and where there is an elevator, we are not allowed to use it. The first floor has a single quote unquote accessible restroom for all 25 of us. When you enter the supposedly accessible toilet stall, you cannot get into the cubicle enough to be able to close the door and lock it. You are required to toilet with the door fully open. Further in the bathroom, the shower cubicle does not have grab bars. It has a backless shower bench. However, I cannot transfer to it and from it. The sinks have pipes that are not wrapped in insulation. Therefore, I've burned my knees in the so-called accessible bathroom, trying to get close enough to the sink to wash my hands. The restroom is slippery and filthy. This is a problem for me as I must use my hands to turn the wheels of my chair and the wheels are resting on filth on the floor of the bathroom. I've had two appointments with shelter housing, shelter housing specialists. The first encounter was to show me an apartment that was physically inaccessible. There was an elevator, but I would have had to climb two flights of stairs, dragging my wheelchair along to get to the elevator. A second encounter was to invite me to a meeting telling me that I would be moving out immediately. However, when I attended the meeting along with 25 other people, including people using wheelchairs, it was a meeting with a drug treatment program called Miracle House. The representative of the program advised us that we could be moved into a room with a roommate and then if we proved ourselves, we could move into a one bedroom unit in a drug rehab facility. The problem is I don't use drug and alcohol and I do not have a history of doing so shoveling people with ambulatory disabilities into drug treatment housing programs to prove themselves is outrageous. I don't need this treatment, I need a place to live. Housing workers come and go, the last one was formerly a building janitor in the building. I am unaware of what specific training housing workers have regarding finding accessible housing. Others with physical disabilities have been here longer than I have. One person who uses a wheelchair, Rudy, has been in the shelter 11 years. I have only met one person who, has a, who is a wheelchair user who's been housed in over one year. The cubicles for caseworkers are not large enough to permit wheelchair access. Therefore, when I meet with a caseworker, my chair is in the hallway. Um, another two residents who have scooters, which are longer, cannot get in at all. There is no turning radius for people who use wheelchairs in this space. At the front entrance, there is a staffed booth that we're supposed to go to if we need help. However, the booth window is not at chair height. If someone in a chair, it, therefore someone in a chair would have to stand and shout to get attention from someone inside the booth. 
To meet requirements, the booth should have a window at chair height. I'm unable to do my laundry without assistance because the washer and dryer are front loaded, but the place to put in the soap is at the top of the machine and I cannot reach it from my chair. Mm. Workers are not interested in helping and need to be yelled at and threatened to get them to assist. Recently, there was a power outage at the Clark Thomas shelter. A man who uses a motorized scooter was trapped in the cafeteria during the seven hour blackout on a heat emergency day. His chair was not charged. He could not get food and water on his own. Given the power outage, he had no air conditioning. Um, also, there are fire drills in the morning, but residents are not brought out of the building nor give instructions on what to do if there is a fire. When there was a gas leak in the building, we were told not to evacuate the building and were sent to the cafeteria. It is not clear that there are any policies and procedures to address how people with disabilities are to be evacuated with their equipment in an emergency. We have a door to the loading dock, however, they are using that area for storage. If this door was the only means of evacuation, then while people with no ambulatory disability could leave by climbing over, people in wheelchairs would not be able to evacuate. If one could leave through this door, one would be on a dock above ground level with no way to evacuate down to the ground using the stairs. Thank you for permitting me to speak. I'm available for your questions. Thank you very much. My turn. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robinson Paolo, and I became homeless about a month ago. Actually, um, before I started, I, I just would like to mention that it, it's really hard for me what I'm going to say because I, for what I already heard, uh, probably DHS is not that interesting to take care of people who's disabled. And that's really sad because it, they have the opportunity to do something for others. They have the opportunity to be light for the one who need it. I am totally independent. I am blind. I become blind a few years ago. Thanks God that I'm totally independent, but there is other people who are not independent like the way I do. I travel by myself, I shower by myself, like the questions they did me when I just um, almost get into the shelter, if I can shower by myself, if I can move around. You just have to look at me. I, I do have a cane, so it's really easy that, of course, I'm gonna be, have, I'm gonna be in trouble to walk around any place. The thing is, is that I have to learn how to do it, and then I can do it by myself. Uh, well, in the time that I've been in the shelter, there is a couple of things that, like for me, that I am blind, uh, I've been issued. There is a lot of people, I am in the medical dorm, and where there is a lot of people who, who doesn't have in content. So there is many accidents there every single day, I mean, it's uh, almost every single day because I cannot exaggerate, but it's uh, about 40 people uh, that we sleep there, we are having the situation that sometimes on the floor there is a stuff that of course I don't see, so I step on them. And it, the reality is really cruel, and, and the cruel reality is that, um, you know, people has inconvenient to go to the bathroom, they make a mess, and it's not because they want, it's because they have an issue. They cannot, uh, they have incontent, so sometimes that kind of things, you know, they're, 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 I'm sorry to say this, but they poop is on the floor and, and the urine too. And the other day, for example, one of the people who was supposed to be here, who is in the, in the hospital right now, he was taking a shower and he just, uh, he was trying to go to the toilet while he was in the shower, he couldn't do it, he's in a wheelchair, so he fell on the floor and all his, uh, his staff was around because the shower was on, so all his staff was around. It, it was a really bad situation that, of course, made him feel so embarrassed in front of everybody, and that was there for hours because nobody went to clean. And uh, like, like, I'm blind, but, but I can move around uh, well, but uh, like, there is a lot of noise, sometimes I, I, I you know, I bump to other people with chairs and, and, uh, and other people came, and sometimes, like we in a shelter, there is different kind of people there. There is people who doesn't like to 
even even is not your intention, but if you touch them with, with my cane, for example, they have really bad reactions. That's why I try to take a shower when everybody, when I, when I feel that everybody's done, uh, you know, I, I go and take a shower because I don't want to pass next to someone because people uh, start having reactions when if I get close to someone. Something that is really ignorant, but there is, there is stuff like that that is going on in the shelter. Uh, actually, the reason why I'm here is because there is other people who are not that independent like me, and I'm not saying, I'm not over here telling, the, telling you that I'm amazing, no, 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 like that, but I already know other people who's blind, that they cannot dress by themselves, that sometimes they cannot shower by themselves. They have problems to walk around. So what's going to happen with it? They, they, they don't have the right to be, a sh to be in a shelter if they need it once in, in their life. Like, for example, in the end of the day, if you look at someone who is blind, someone who is in a wheelchair, someone who is in a bed that they cannot move their body at all, I mean, if you look, if you look to them and then you look yourself in the mirror, what you can see? Are they different? Are we different than others? And I'm not saying that because I, I feel like people make me feel different. No, it's not that the reason why I'm saying that. It's because it is impossible to believe that in New York City, the capital of the world, I mean, will be people who, because they are sick or they have any kind of disability, that they're gonna be without a shelter. And of course, if we, if we are in a city where they can get the funds to do it, I'm not, I probably I'm not, but probably you will not see my face anyone else in your life, but I'm just gonna say that if there is a way that DHAs can cooperate us, can cooperate, and other organizations, I don't know exactly where the funds get, but I mean, if they can probably help DHS to do the job better, probably that will be awesome. Because totally it's not their fault. There is, in the shelter that I am, there is a lot of people who has good intention, but they are not prepared to deal with people, to dealing with people who is disabled. And that is not their fault. They are not getting paid to serve people who are disabled. Nobody told them to do that. Nobody prepared them to do that. And, and actually, there is things that could be changed. And, and I think if all of us, we're here right now because we want to do something positive, I mean, if we're here now, I mean, why, why don't, don't do it? Uh, actually, I, I just have a concern about um, people who, people who really, I mean, there is some questions that they were written in the beginning. They did me that questions. And of course, I have to say yes to everything what they asked because I was afraid if I say no, they're going to leave me without a shelter. And they did me that questions. They did it. If I can walk around, if I can uh, shower, if I can, go to, if I have problems to go to my bed, they give me all that kind of questions. So of course, I have to say yes, like other people who's in my dorm that I, that I already know, they had to say yes also because otherwise they're not gonna have a shelter. So I just wish you the best. I, I, I wish you the best. I just can say that, you know, do the best, and, and, and Hashem Elohim, or God, our divinity, can do the, can do the rest and, and try to do something for people who really need it. Because we, like I didn't ask to be homeless, nobody asked to be homeless. That could happen to, even though if you, are, if you are a drug addicted, even though if you are a person that never did drugs in your life, that could happen to anyone, like happened to me. So, I mean, I just want to say that if you have the opportunity to do something, if DHS can cooperate, Thank you. You know, let's do it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Carlo. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Everybody. Sorry, if you could push the, the button through. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the button, the, the, it should be on red. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ada Colon. I am a social worker at Beverly Living Freedom House. I work at the domestic violence site. Um, I'm here representing Ms. Rosa Amparo. And um, as you mentioned earlier, she couldn't make it because she's in the hospital. But I have been working with Ms. Amparo and she gave me the okay to be representing her today. And I am honored to be here on her behalf. So I just wanna talk about what happened when she went to Franklin. She was discharged from the shelter on May 21st. She went to the Franklin's Women's Shelter for placement. 
once we, um, the first thing that happened when we entered the shelter system, we were stopped there by one of the guards and um, the guard basically what, what he asked, Ms. Amparo and I went, Ms. Amparo was there and also her home field aide who um, escorted her. Once we enter, the guard, you know, asked to put everything through the detector, the metal detector, and um, the, the guard said, will you, you have to wait here until the supervisor comes to grant you access. And this happened because Ms. Amparo has needles in her bags as she's a diabetic. And there was also another stuff like the glucose meter and other items that she had there. Um, one of the things that we also mentioned is that we had food in the bags because Ms. Amparo has to eat constantly to keep her sugar levels, you know, balanced. And there was a huge sign, as soon as you enter, you can see the sign, it says, no food or drink allowed. So I made sure to explain that to the guard. Once we were able to speak to the supervisor, she came and asked, who's here for placement? Um, I spoke on behalf of Ms. Amparo because she doesn't speak English. And I said, Ms. Amparo is here for placement. And, and then uh, the person next to her is her home field aide. And as soon as I mentioned the word home field aide, the supervisor says, come here. So I go to her and I found that a little awkward that she just called me. But I went to her and I say, yes, what's going on? And she said, um, you just said the magic word. And I said, uh, what do you mean? She said, she can be here because she has a home field aid. We do not allow home field aids to come into the shelter. And to my response to this was, well, Ms. Amparo needs her home field aid to get through the day and do her ADLs. And she said, well, I will have to pro uh, handle this over to the director and we will take it from there. At the point that the director took over, she took us in into another office. And she was addressing me the whole time. She wouldn't be speaking to Ms. Amparo because, again, she didn't speak English, so she was uh, facing me the entire time. And I said to the director, we understand that Ms. Amparo cannot be helped here because she has a home built A. How is that possible? So the director, so this is what happened with the director. She says, um, we cannot take her because she has a home field aid and people with home field aid cannot be here because they are not independent and the aid will not be allowed to come into the shelter to help her. And then she asked me, how is the home field aid helping Ms. Amparo? And I told her in details, she's helping her with her ADLs and I gave her a list of things that she was helping her with. And then she says, you see, that's what I mean. She cannot be alone here because she needs help. She needs someone to do things for her and we cannot allow the aid to come inside. I was very frustrated by her response, and I thought that it was really unfair for Ms. Amparo. Then I explained to her that Ms. Amparo is connected to the disabilities right of New York, and that she had a legal advocate that was aware of what was going on, and that the legal advocate had told us that Ms. Amparo has the right to have her home built aid at Franklin. So, at this point, I even offered to have the, um, the legal advocate speaking to the director and also the supervisor at Franklin, but they refused to speak to her. And the director says, you should take your legal advocate and go to 33rd Street to DHS and advocate there. At this point, they said, uh, is she connected to any PCP or any hospital? I said, I already knew what she was gonna say. And I said, Ms. Amparo was already at the emergency room at the Mount Sinai. The hospital is not gonna help her to get placement. She said, well, um, she will get placement through the hospital because that is the same thing that we would have done here. She said, she cannot stay here. You gotta go to uh, the nearest hospital, which was the Bronx Lebanon. So we did as they told us. We went to the hospital. There we got connected with a social worker. And obviously the hospital is not a place to get housing. They can do anything for Ms. Amparo there. So prior to get to the hospital, Ms. Amparo had a nervous breakdown because of all the stress that she was being put through. And also uh, she was testing her sugar levels and everything in the street. It was just a horrible situation. The A was like in one side, I was in the other side just calming her down. It was very traumatic for her. 
Once at the hospital, nothing happened. We were there for hours. Eventually, we got connected with the hotline. They couldn't do anything. I ended up calling back my director at the shelter, explaining the situation. And we have to go back into the shelter with Ms. Amparo because ethically and morally, we couldn't leave this woman in the street. She has a lot of uh, medical um, issues, and she had a walker. She has physical impediment, and it was just inhumane to leave Ms. Amparo in the streets. So we brought her back into the DV shelter, and that's what happened. Thank you very much for, for that testimony. I think that, I mean, it's, it's tragic and very sad, and um, um, we should learn from her experience how to not let that ever happen again. Um, I want to thank this whole panel. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time to do questions for you all, but wanted to hear everybody's, uh, what everybody had to say in full. And we will follow up with you all. And I think that there's a lot that can come out of this hearing and a lot of work that we can collectively do. Um, and I want to thank you so much for your testimony. But unfortunately, we, we have to be out. We have two more panels and have to be out by, you know, supposed to be out by four. I don't know if that's going to happen. But, um, but again, I want to thank all, the, all of you. Thank you for your courage in testifying. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Corallo and, and, uh, and Mr. Paolo, thank you very much for your testimony here. Um, and, uh, and, and Ms. Colon, thank you for, for your, your, your amazing work with, uh, uh, with, your, with your client. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, next panel. Oh, do you have anything you want to be um, so Susan Duho can will testif uh, testify on her own behalf, or on behalf of Sid Sydney. Um, Beth Hoffmeister and Jacqueline Simone, Legal Aid Society and Coalition for the Homeless. Jenny Veloz, New York Lawyers for Public Interest. And I think from here on out, we are going to have to put people, people, we're going to have to use the clock. Sorry. Hi, everybody. Who wants to begin? Thank you very much. And if there's a three-minute clock. Yes. Um, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Uh, as you know, Sydney was involved with Legal Aid Society and Coalition for the Homeless in a lawsuit seeking to bring the Department for Homeless Services into compliance with civil rights law, the ADA. Um, in signing the stipulation, the city agreed to accomplish a number of things within five years retrofit existing facilities, ensure accessibility in future facilities, provide reasonable accommodations, ensure that people are not segregated because of their disability, ensure that emergency plans include particular needs of people with disabilities. However, we have noticed a number of persistent and emergency, emerging issues. Um, DHS has stated that capital improvement design and construction in the pipeline and newly opened sites that are privately owned will meet all building codes. However, according to the Fair Housing Justice Center, state building code is not deemed to be a safe harbor. And while builders must follow the state building codes, they must also follow the Fair Housing Act requirements. Homeless shelters, whether operated by a city or a non-city entity under contract, must comply with requirements related to service animals, modifications, wheelchair access, accessible entrances to public and common areas, doors, bathrooms, etc. If this were happening now, then there would not be so much successful litigation against building owners, managers, and architects. People with disabilities have a right to live in the most integrated setting. Um, DHS provided services for people with disabilities who need assistance with ADLs, providing a small number of beds at a shelter called Barrier Free. 
This facility has a, an excellent reputation for very good reason. However, it has been closed and the city's actions played a role in its closure. Although it was a wonderful program though, it was segregated. People with disabilities must be able to participate in an integrated program. Uh, they may not be refused housing in any shelter because they need assistance with activities of daily living and they may not be excluded altogether because of requiring this assistance. N needing assistance with activities of daily living is not the same as having a medical need. It is simply assistance with dressing, holding a tray, um, transferring from a chair or into a bed. These are not medical issues. There is no hospital and no nursing facility that will keep people simply because they need assistance with activities of daily living. That is not the world we live in, nor should they be there. Um, <laughs> we are alarmed that the city is proposing to stop serving people who need assistance with activities of daily living. We work with people who are in nursing facilities and hospitals every single day to help them get discharged safely into an appropriate place, into their own home. However, there is no easy out. Discharge planners do not do discharge planning in hospitals and nursing facilities. They simply make a call and do a packet for a homeless shelter. If uh, the homeless shelter doesn't take someone, then they simply are, are left by the nursing facility. And we've seen this happen. Um, yes, there's a need to push back at nursing homes and hospitals, but not at the expense of people with disabilities being left on the street. The OPWDD program is not an emergency shelter program. There is nothing like that available. Most people with disabilities do not meet OPWDD criteria either and therefore would not be eligible. The Olmstead housing subsidy helps people get out into housing with a housing subsidy and assistance with looking for housing. However, because of the housing situation, once someone is accepted in the program, it takes a year to two years to get them out into housing. No nursing facility is going to house people for this length of time, much as we may push them. Reasonable accommodations must be provided and they have to be provided in a timely way. They cannot be from a set menu that is exclusive. Reasonable accommodations are to be individually negotiated. That is the law. It is not a take it or leave it situation. It is not a matter where somebody can say, you come to the door and I'm going to give you large print only because that's what I have and you're blind. That is not gonna be effective communication. So you have to give an effective, reasonable accommodation in that event. Um, people who are coming into shelters are not being advised that they have rights to reasonable accommodations. They're not getting notice. They have no notice that they have a right to complain if they don't get one or that it should be negotiated. Um, I am particularly alarmed by Mr. Jones having been, his accounts of fire drills and power outages, which are life and death issues. Should there really have been a fire or an explosion due to a gas leak or some other event, people with disabilities would have been trapped in that facility and died. There's absolutely no excuse for this. There, uh, the ADA requires inclusive planning, inclusive emergency preparedness and disaster response planning. And there are a whole host of requirements that I've outlined in my testimony. Last year, we served nearly 40,000 people. Those that we serve are living in poverty on a long-term basis. The poverty rate among people with disabilities is 35%. It's higher than at the state or federal level, much higher than for people with no disability. Many of those we see in homeless shelters, we try to help come out into the community. Um, but we need assistance from the city to resolve this matter. We need continuing inquiries into the city's efforts to come into compliance with Butler. Um, I wanna thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your testimony and for your work. 
Hi, Chairs Levin and Ayala. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Beth Hoffmeister, and I'm from the Legal Aid Society. Um, in an effort to stay within my time frame, I just want to amplify, amplify a couple of points. Um, obviously, Susan did a beautiful job laying out a lot of the issues as we're seeing them, as did our clients and the prior panel and other uh, clients that different providers are working with. But it's clear that the reasons that we filed Butler, um, there are still issues with the compliance and with um, kind of real-time issues that are coming up here and there with individual clients that we're still having to do all this advocacy for as the implementation rolls out. This is in my testimony, but I did want to flag that in the interim, before you hit the five or possibly more year mark when the entire settlement is actually finalized, um, there is an opportunity for advocates to reach out to us directly to help with reasonable accommodations that aren't being met at the time. Um, and you can email us at butlercase at legalaid.org or contact us at the hotline, which is 1-800-649-9125. So I wanted to make sure that that was at least put out uh, so that we can help other individuals during this interim stage. I want to, again, underline and underscore what Susan said about ADLs not being necessarily a medical issue, that disability and medical issues are different, and there are times where like very occasionally in a Venn diagram they might overlap a little bit, but that ADL issues are not necessarily related to a hospital stay or medical issue. So um, I just think it's important as we talk about dealing with those issues that it, that be amplified and restated again, because I think they were, it was a little bit confusing in some of the testimony today about how that interacted because Butler, we filed on behalf of all clients in shelter who have disabilities, and sometimes some people may need some accommodations related to specific medical issues, but that those two things are distinct from one another, and it's important to make that, make that clear. It's also worth noting that we, and we did this in our testimony, that really household composition can often be the difference between whether someone is able to have a home health aid uh, and is able to get assistance with all the activities of daily living and some other things, and that um, you know, as as we continue to move forward with um, the implementation of the settlement and continue to offer comments on the various policies, plans, and procedures um, as uh, DHS lays them out for us in the in the guidelines of the settlement, um, that this is an issue that we are continuing to look at. Um, I think I just want to close real quick before uh, Jackie continues for Coalition for the Homeless and just say that we are very appreciative of the Council's continued focus on this issue and we are always welcome to have continued meetings and answer any questions, particularly about the settlement as it's continuing to be rolled out. Good afternoon, my name is Jacqueline Simone. I'm a policy analyst at Coalition for the Homeless and uh, we submitted joint testimony with Legal Aid Society. Um, I wanna thank especially all of the clients who came out here today to share their firsthand experiences. It was, not it was not easy for them to get to lower Manhattan. Often they were coming from shelters very far away and I think it was really amazing to have their voices heard. Um, I also wanna say that while improving shelter conditions is vitally important, we should also be focused on supporting this client population by expanding the set-asides for truly accessible and low-income housing, as Chair Levin mentioned. Um, no one has to wait for the Butler settlement process to proceed to ensure that New Yorkers with disabilities in shelter have access to permanent housing. Um, we saw in the mayor's management report that was released this week that residents are staying in shelters longer, and in fact, the average length of stay in shelters for single adults was 401 days in fiscal year 2018, which is up nearly 100 days from fiscal year 2014. And we know from people that we serve at the coalition that often people with physical disabilities have the longest length of stay in the shelter system. Um, now, it's, it's worth noting that some newly constructed buildings are physically accessible, certainly not all of them, um, but they may be better able to accommodate residents with disabilities who already have a smaller pool from which to access affordable housing. Um, and in fact, two of the named plaintiffs in the Butler case are currently living in accessible units that are part of that HPD set-aside process. This is part of the reason why we, along with other members of the How's Our Future NY campaign, continue to call on the mayor to allocate at least 10% of his Housing New York 2.0 plan to homeless New Yorkers, including 24,000 units created through new construction. And we encourage the council to continue to explore advocacy around permanent housing as a means to support this population and get them out of shelters. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. 
Hello, good afternoon. First off, I would like to thank Chairperson Levin and Chairperson Ayala for the opportunity to present testimony today. My name is Jenny Veloz. I am an advocate in the Disability Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. And our Disability Justice Program works to advance civil rights and ensure equality of opportunity, self-determination, and independence of New Yorkers with disabilities. NYLPI disability advocates have, present, have represented thousands of individuals and have won campaigns improving the lives of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers. Through our work, we have witnessed the impact inaccessible shelters have on families where a member of the family has a disability. A mother living with her 18-year-old daughter who has cerebral palsy and uses a wheelchair takes her daughter up and down the stairs every day all by herself so that she can go to school because the shelter does not have an accessible entrance. They have been in the shelter system for years and are having a challenging time finding an apartment because no one will accept their, their voucher. They currently have a link voucher. This mother does not have case management services to assist her in securing permanent housing for herself and her daughter. This is just one of many examples of how the shelter system is failing, not only individuals with disabilities, but their families as well. There is an appalling lack of accessibility for people who have disabilities in the New York City shelter system. Individuals with physical, mental, and intellectual disabilities are not provided the appropriate services and supports in these homeless shelters. People who use wheelchairs are placed in shelters that are wholly inaccessible. Federal, state, and city law mandate equal access for persons with disabilities in these shelters. But accessibility extends beyond physical modifications. Accessibility means providing resources such as qualified counselors and case managers. Accessibility also means making sure that individuals, especially those with disabilities, are given the tools to maintain permanent housing. For example, getting assistance with finding an apartment, assuring that individuals are not discriminated against because they have a voucher, and providing post-shelter case management to make sure that individuals remain self-sufficient and do not return to the shelters. Oftentimes, people are given vouchers and told to look for apartments within a specified amount of time, usually without any guidance. Their attempts to find housing are unsuccessful because they are told by landlords, realtors, and management companies that their vouchers will not be accepted. They are then forced to return to the shelters with no assistance on how to proceed. They have no recourse but to continue to stay in shelters for the unforeseeable future. New York lawyers for the public New York Lawyers for the Public Interest in order to ensure that New York City meets its obligations to ensure that people with disabilities are provided with equal access on the law have a few recommendations. Finance and incentivize construction to improve accessibility of current, shelter, of current facilities. Properly screen individuals to ensure that individuals with disabilities are sent to accessible shelters. Providing counseling for individuals with mental and intellectual disabilities providing case, case management services during and after shelter stay with emphasis on preventing discrimination based on a person having a voucher. Ensure HRA enforcement of vouchers by landlords and management companies. And also create a hotline to report landlords and management companies that do not accept these vouchers. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I want to thank this entire panel for your testimony for all the good work that you do every day. Um, advocating um, uh, for a better uh, shelter system, for a, a better city, um, and for uh, the people that, that, uh, that need assistance. And so I greatly appreciate all the work you do. I look forward to continuing to work with you. I think there's a lot of work that we can do um, in, the, in the coming couple of years um, coming out of, uh, uh, of, of this hearing. So I would greatly appreciate the opportunity to work with you all uh, moving forward. Final panel, uh, Tawaki Kamatsu, Sophia Zenobia Mann, uh, Elizabeth Betsy Lynam, Ronald Braxton, and Paul Feuerstein. Last but not least.
and we'll be on the three minute clock. We have written testimony, I think, from everybody as well, so uh, whoever wants to begin. Paul, you want to start? My name is Paul Feuerstein. I'm the founder and CEO of Barrier Free Living. It's been spoken about today. We actually opened the first singles not-for-profit shelter in the homeless system in November of 1990. We were part of the group that was funded by Ed Koch and his Capital Homeless Housing Program, and we were the first to open at that period of time. Uh, those bragging rights also meant that we had one of the lowest reimbursement rates in the city. When we met with Gilbert lucky Taylor, you. Uh, lucky you, yeah. yeah, lucky me. When we met with Gilbert Taylor uh, shortly after Mayor De Blasio was was elected, uh, we looked at our budget and it was a thousand dollars less than when we started in fiscal '91. In the Bloomberg years, our funds were cut. Every capital request we made was denied over that period of time. And as a result, our building deteriorated. We knew when we met with Commissioner Taylor that we needed new elevators. We couldn't get parts for our old elevators. They, they are importing handmade parts from China at this point to keep our elevators going. It was kind of a ridiculous thing. There were about a $1.2 million worth of work we needed, knew needed to be done. He suggested an engineering survey. We met with him at the end of April. We had bids by sometime in May. It took till December to get approved. And the engineers who looked at our building in April and then came back in January to do a thorough study found that there were, there were floors that had dropped three quarters of an inch between the time they'd first come in and the time they were doing their examination. I'm not an engineer, but I understand that's a pretty big deal. Uh, ultimately, we came up with a $4.4 million plan, as well as a plan to be able to fix the building so it would be operational for another 25 years, because we know that's the deal when we take capital money. Um, the city said, we don't have $4.4 million for you. We can't be helpful. We went to the State for Money Homeless Housing Assistance Corporation. Uh, we had to do two applications because the first time around we were too late. The second was blocked by HRA because they essentially said, we would like you to expand your program, be part of the gateway program, create permanent housing on the same site that you had shelter. And for two years we looked for alternate space. Every space we found was denied. I had suggested reaching out to Health and Hospital Corporation to DHS, they finally did that. We were shown two spots. One was a psychiatric ward in Woodhull, which was totally inaccessible. The other was a totally empty ward at Kohler. Not in use, hadn't been in use for a number of years. It would have been ideal. However, two or three weeks later, we got a call from New York One and the, the local paper saying, we understand you're opening a halfway house on Roosevelt Island. And we said, we have nothing to report because we were nowhere near talking with anybody about that. But there was a 180 degree turn in terms of the attitude of health and hospitals after that happened. We went to your colleague, Ben Kalos. He helped us with other electeds. We got support from Community Board 8 and it was only afterwards we were told it was really about, you know, Superstorm Sandy and floodplains and everything else. I don't know what happened to that empty ward, but it would have been big enough for us to move our program. We were successful at getting over 750 severely disabled people put in permanent housing in New York City, and we had one of the lowest recidivism rates in the homeless system. It was a successful model. We didn't get the support we needed to be able to move forward. When we talked about the gateway process, the last meeting we had with DHS, we were told by the number two person at DHS, we're no longer interested in working with people as disabled as your folks. We want, to, want you to work with more independent people with disabilities. And my board essentially said thanks, but no thanks. The other piece of it that- Was that in writing, by the way? Was that no, that was a verbal conversation. Okay. Uh, the other piece of it was, at the end of the day, we were mandated by a court in upstate New York to take a level three sex offender into our program, which was co-ed. 
He had been in prison and then in a psychiatric facility for 10 years because he was deemed as being too out of control to be safe in the community. DHS lawyers tried to object, our lawyers tried to object, but the, the court held strong on that. And I essentially said to DHS staff, if we are having permanent housing for survivors of domestic violence and permanent housing for severely disabled people in this same building in the Gateway model, we have no appetite for future referrals from, uh, by registered sex offenders. And what I was told was, if we get them, you get them. And that what pretty much between the independent issue and the sex offender issue was the poison pills that led us to say, we're not going to proceed in doing another shelter there. Okay, well, I think there's a lot, uh, a lot to go to move forward on there, and you certainly have my commitment uh, yeah. that I will advocate for a reestablishment of the program. Uh, mm -hmm. I interpreted a willingness from DSS and DHS to be open to that, it seemed, from this testimony today, so let's see where it goes. Let's see where it goes. One issue which I think is a learning piece that hasn't quite come through. We were told we could get a 20-year mortgage, a 20-year contract to, to service a mortgage, and I said, what about capital reserves? And we still said, no, we don't do that. I wouldn't do another building without the ability to have capital reserves because it's the only way you can keep the fabric of a building going. And that's a problem that hasn't been addressed yet by the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee yep. in terms of the cost of keeping buildings open for not-for-profits. Well, let's keep talking. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Elizabeth Lynham. I am the Chief Program Officer of AHRC New York City. Uh, as you may know, we are one of the largest nonprofit provider organizations in the nation. We serve 15,000 people uh, yearly that have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our budget's about 300 million a year. So we have a wide array of services that we offer uh, residential, uh, clinical, educational, uh, day supports, uh, employment supports, etc. cetera. Uh, I wanted to talk to you uh, a little bit today uh, from the perspective of the OPWDD system. Um, we have, um, in the past, uh, had very strong relationships with OPWDD. Uh, in the shelter system, there may be uh, many, many adults who are disabled, as we've all heard today, up to 42%, I think, by some estimates. And we support wholeheartedly the implementation uh, swiftly of the Butler settlement. Um, but we also encourage the shelter system to think a little bit more broadly about disability. Uh, the footprint is not just um, around physical disability or mobility issues, but we've heard a lot today about accommodations uh, with daily living and other sorts of accommodations for blind individuals and, and disabilities of all sorts. So when we uh, talk about our population that we serve uh, at AHRC New York City, we serve individuals uh, that have a, a wide variety of um, needs, and especially in the shelter system, are vulnerable and significantly vulnerable. So we have three points we'd like you to consider uh, today as we think about that more broadly, and that is um, the responsibility for kids in the shelter system. Um, there are many children in the shelter system that could benefit from services and also from screening uh, for uh, developmental delays. Uh, right now, uh, there are um, significant problems uh, maintaining the continuity of services. Uh, in special education, for example, there are as many as 4,000 kids who probably should get special ed services in the preschool system that do not uh, for a variety of reasons, including the transient nature of their accommodations. Uh, we know that the department has looked at uh, trying to do a little more care coordination, um, look at the addresses and try to make the uh, constant correspondence that comes out more available to parents. But it is really critically important, uh, as everyone knows, to screen kids for developmental delays and uh, attach appropriate services so that they can have early intervention and uh, have, a, have a reduced um, 
lifelong need uh, as much as possible from those early, inventor, in, early intervention services. So there's an important child find responsibility there uh, which needs to take place and to main sh make sure that once children are identified they get referred and get appropriate services. Two, I wanted to speak about adults. Uh, many adults with IDD in the system uh, may not be getting appropriate referral. And there we need to re-engage strong government partners like the OPWDD partners in the region uh, who need to take responsibility for helping adults uh, find appropriate accommodation and housing throughout the New York City area. This can be a challenge, but it is a partnership that in the past we felt was a strong one that needs to be reinvigorated. For example, there used to be a liaison who would come out and screen within 36 hours from the regional office any adult suspected of IDD within the shelter system. That has not happened in recent years, so we encourage you to look at the responsibility to adults for appropriate referral and placement into systems that we've heard a lot about today that may be more appropriate for their support. Finally, I'd like to say that there are many uh, individuals with disabilities who fall through the cracks in the current safety net. As we know, we've heard about uh, adults uh, with mental illness and behavioral health issues. Um, some of those are duly diagnosed with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They are, uh, in particular, um, difficult to find placement for. They don't fit squarely into either system, OPW or the Office of Mental Health and Hygiene purview, so we need to look at creative and flexible ways to develop options for them. Uh, we also have uh, high-functioning, uh, increasingly uh, autistic individuals who need a certain kinds of accommodation and supports that don't fit squarely into either system. So we need to look very explicitly at certain groups uh, uh, within the safety net and try to um, develop creative and flexible alternatives for those groups in particular. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. I will close on that note. You also have my written comments there with you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sophia Mann. I am here as a Community Board 10 member, which represents Central Harlem from 110 to 155th from 5th Avenue over. Um, and also I work in nonprofit in development, specifically with the DOE Fund, so they deal with homelessness, as well as finding services and, and alternatives for people who have experienced homelessness and, and um, are dealing with re-entry into society from prison. And also, I am here as an advocate because my brother has severe autism, cerebral palsy, seizure disorder, et cetera. So I am very familiar with OPWDD. I'm very familiar with dealing with Medicare and Medicaid as a family. And um, also the dangers when it comes to when people might fall through the cracks or when the voluntary agencies that handle services for people with disabilities are not able to provide for them come an emergency situation and just bring to the attention of people the, the fact that, although it was mentioned many times today as an alternative, just very quickly, like, oh yeah, you can access OBWDD. It's, it's, not that, it's not that easy, and families don't necessarily have access to individuals should an emergency arise or their housing situation is compromised in any way. So particularly in the context of inclement weather season coming up, um, I wanted to realize that this is very relevant um, because although people with intellectual disabilities may have housing through their agency, um, I know from my experience with Sandy, my brother was, their generators failed, they didn't have adequate um, care while they were in the housing, um, which, which wasn't, uh, it was not feasible to also access him as well. Um, being out in housing in Canarsie. And so I think it's very helpful if there was increased, I know representatives are not here now, co coordination between your committee, Department of Homeless Services, and these voluntary agencies to make them aware that should it come up that A, if someone needs homeless services for any reason, whether it's a death in the family and services are not accessible to them or however, um, that it's not an option now, or it's not a feasible option now, and that also if anyone needs to access shelter services come any failing regarding uh, weather or whatever, <laughs> that it's also not feasible for agencies to turn to um, the shelter system for emergency, um, emergency help. Um, also, as a community board member, we consistently deal with public safety complaints about 
people loitering and the answer is always, oh, Department of um, Homeless Services does do outreach um, to these individuals and they might decline services. However, they might make a turnaround and come back. Um, and as you know, many people who might need homeless services are dealing with many different challenges. One more second. Including uh, mental health, disability, etc. So it would be really wonderful. I know it was said it was disseminated. But to again bring that conversation to light because just last night we had a public safety meeting and it was definitely the genuine concern of many people how to adequately help community members and also give um, give real answers to concerned community members who say, we have this issue, but we also don't want to just refer them to anybody. So that would be wonderful if that conversation could be had with community boards and, and local, local representatives. That's it. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tawaki Komatsu. I've testified at your meetings uh, previously to no avail. Um, with regards to your committee, I think there are 11 people on the committee, but I see only about three of you. So with regards to the due process rights of the people who entered the chamber, to, to, cham, cham, ugh, chamber today to be heard, um, where are your, your colleagues to actually honor people's fundamental uh, due process rights? Um, this meeting is about disabilities, uh, ensuring that people with disabilities are getting the services, stuff they, they deserve. Let's take a look at this video that I recorded of a, a military veteran in the building where I, res where I reside. Sorry, I'm a crappy public speaker. And he's not getting services that he needs. He needs repairs, they're not being met. I talked to uh, Fraud Banks who left the chamber earlier today. Um, last time I talked to him was on August 22nd and he basically blew me off. So you guys can l watch this video or at least listen to the audio. Anyway, let me cut to the chase. Um, I have a federal lawsuit against the city. I also have a New York State Supreme Court lawsuit against HRA directly. Both of them are active. I also have separate litigation involving OTDA, the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance. So basically I have a th uh, three-pronged lawsuit against HRA and the city. I've testified at your uh, public hearings repeatedly to no avail. So um, let me g just give a shout out to federal judge Gabrielle Gorenstein, who's presiding over my federal lawsuit. So my intent is essentially to put a stranglehold of all, for all the funding that's being uh, given to HRA to, to conduct its operations and to essentially forcibly have Mr. Banks fired. That's the conclusion of my testimony. Is there anything anyone else wants to add? One or two other pieces. Uh, the last time there was a survey of nursing homes in New York City by HHS, 9,200 people who were living in nursing homes in the city said that they would rather be living in the community. The average cost of a nursing home in New York, according to the health, state health department right now, 
is $147,828 a year. So we're spending a tremendous amount of money to keep people in institutions. And when we've we created supportive housing, but people who were in rehabilitation facilities, people who were in institutions, didn't qualify for supportive housing because they weren't considered homeless. Mm -hmm. They had to be in a homeless shelter or on the streets for a year of the last two or two of the last four. And there were a whole group of women veterans who were victims of sexual assault that we wanted to move into mm -hmm. our supportive housing program. We couldn't because they were in a rehab facility and that wasn't considered homeless. So I want to thank this panel uh, for your testimony. I want to thank everybody that uh, stayed throughout this, the course of this hearing. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your um, insight into this issue. Uh, clearly there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. Um, I look forward to working with my colleague, Chair Ayala, uh, moving forward. And, and Chair, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I just wanted to thank you all for attending today's hearing. Thank you so much. Okay. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>